And the Gaon from Vilna said that in the last war, you know how long the war was going to be? 12 minutes. Tonight we're going to talk about the most important topic, that's how I see it, the most important. Everything is important, but the most important topic is to understand that Mashiach is already here. Uh, not here in Great Neck, but he's in Eretz Yisrael. Some people say, oh, he's here, I, I didn't see him. Yeah. So he's not here in Great Neck, he's here, I mean, in the world and he's in Eretz Yisrael. And we are standing before a very, very unique time that thousands of years thousands of years everybody was waiting for the redemption great prophets great sages rabbis thousands and thousands of desperate people everybody was waiting for this moment and we are the lucky ones to see it with our own eyes and I know that most people when you start talking about Mashiach they roll their eyes ah, ah. And I, I can relate with that. It's something that is very hard to imagine that the world is going to change. But don't forget that about 80 years ago the world changed and had a massive change in World War II. And they also didn't think that the world is going to change. People in, the, in 1938 and 1939, when they were warned, ah, ah, that was the ah syndrome. <clears throat> and I'm not saying it because I'm guessing. I'm saying it because my grandmother, who only died a few years ago in the age of 92, she lived through the Holocaust in Berlin. And she was a teenager. She wasn't a little girl. So we're going to touch that a little bit because we have a problem as humans and even more as Jews that we tend to push everything to the last minute and we don't take things serious. Even 3,400 years ago, when the Jews left Mitzrayim, they were, ah, and they saw Moshe Rabbeinu, and they had the ah syndrome. <laughs> the ah. So, I feel that it's the most important topic to talk about, because most people are numb. Three years ago, I gave a lecture here in Queens that got, I don't know exactly, somewhere around 2 million views on the internet. And probably tens of thousands of people who did Shuvah and thousands of people who actually moved to Israel. It was a very powerful lecture and, and it made a big change. And there were great miracles right after that because it was right after that came Rosh Hashanah. And I do believe that our nation did good Shuvah and a lot of bad decrees were, were annulled. But I'm sure you all noticed that something is changing. I'm here in the United States from last Wednesday. Every encounter that I have, uh, we had a big Shabbaton in Queens, I meet a lot of people, we had a g big lecture yesterday, big lecture on Thursday. Nobody wants to say it out loud, but every, comes, every, every person comes and tells me, is this time to go? I feel something. Mm -hmm. Something's going on. If you feel that, then you're 100% right. If you don't feel that, then you're 100% numb. <laughs> and, uh, and something that needs to be addressed, because I look at people everybody's numb because if you wouldn't be numb you wouldn't be here right now and Wednesday when I landed I met a dear friend we sat down to eat somewhere and I'm looking around and in my mind that's when I was fresh I just came off the plane I mean uh, you know it says Eretz Israel is like a hundred degrees higher than uh, anywhere out of Eretz Israel you know when you go when I go out of Eretz Israel it's like uh, losing altitude so when I land here it's like whew, whoa and I was looking around I was like wow look at all look at all these sleeping people yeah. they're just eating 
you know, with their phones. <laughs> it's just ridiculous to see there. So, we have to talk about the reality. Many people choose to close their ears. Many people choose to close their eyes. Many people choose to turn their head away. But the smart ones, listen. So hopefully, some of you, and Baruch Hashem, there's a lot of cameras here tonight, so hopefully there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be smart to listen and open their ears. <clears throat> we do know that there's going to be a huge war that our sages call it Gog and Magog. I'm sure you heard the term many times. This is known as the last war, the final war, before Mashiach is going to come. I know a lot of people saying all sorts of excuses, it's a myth, it's a metaphor, whatever it is, it is a war. And the war actually started. In the previous lecture that I gave about Mashiach, I was also explaining how this war is also spiritual. There's a spiritual Gog and Magog and there's a physical Gog and Magog. But tonight we're going to talk mainly about the physical Gog and Magog. Now, there are many prophecies about Gog and Magog. One of them is, can be found in the book of Yechezkel, or in English he's called Ezekiel. This is in chapter 38, where it says about a certain king, Gog, coming from the land of Magog. On this pr uh, prophecy, Rashi, a commentator, says that Gog is the king and Magog is the land. Uh, sorry, the, the nation. Sorry, Gog is the king, Magog is the nation. A different commentary by Abarbanel says that Gog is the nation and Magog is a place in the world. But nevertheless, we do have a clear prophecy from Yechezkel about this Gog and Magog, a king from some land that is going to come and wage war. The prophecy is saying that he's going to be the king from the north and is going to come to wage south, uh, war on the south. Not that I'm saying who's Gog, there are different of opinions who's Gog, but we do know of a certain ruler, of one of the biggest countries in the world, the most one of the most powerful countries in the world, that is positioned in the north, and he's coming now south to wage war. And that's Vladimir Putin. If you look exactly at where uh, 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 Russia is positioned, Exactly where Moscow is, is a b exactly north of Yerushalayim. A few years ago, I usually fly with the Israeli air airline. One time, I, w I flew with the Russian airline. And it had a stop in Moscow. And then we switched planes. As I was sitting on the plane, you know, they have this map where the plane flies. And I was looking, and I was like, look at this. I'm not a great geographer, but I was like, look at that. Moscow is exactly above Yerushalayim. Right, right on the top. So I'm not saying that, uh, that Putin is Gog. Don't take my words out of context. There are opinions saying that he's Gog, that he's the king from the north that's going to come south and wage war. And that we can see with our own eyes. Some opinion says that Gog is uh, the, the prime minister of Turkey, Erdogan. But nevertheless, this is not what I want to talk about. I'm not going to go into to guessing who's who. This is not so relevant. But let's take the prophecy of Ezekiel and we know about a king that's going to come from the north and is going to come down south to wage a war. Now where is this Gog? If we're going by the, prophet, by the commentary of Abarbanel saying that, that Magog is the country, so where is this? Where is this place? First of all, we have to understand who is Gog and where he comes from. This should be pretty fresh in your mind because we're only in Parashat Vayechi. Go back a few Parashot to Parashat Noach. After the destruction of the world in the flood, Noah comes out of the ark with three kids, Shem, Ham, and Yefet. And it says to us the names of the kids of Shem, Ham, and Yefet. The sons of Yefet are Gomer and Magog. This is where Gog comes from. This is the lineage where it comes from. We know Shem, we are the descendants of Shem, and so forth. Now, there is a Midrash. This is called Midrash Tanchuma. Commentaring on Parashat Korach. I am going to say a lot of sources. Don't, don't have to write it down. Don't try to memorize it. You can watch the video and later on, those, on the video will be all the text with all the, the, the 
sources. I know many people like to check the sources themselves. And I actually highly recommend for you to check the sources because I'm just giving you a detail. Not the actual story and not the word behind that. But nevertheless, in the Midrash Tanchuma, in Parashat Korach, it's talking about the story of Gog and Magog. And then it puts, pulls out a very interesting uh, detail. The numerical value of the words Gog u Magog is 70. And in that story in the Midrash, it says that you know what's going to be the war? That this king, Gog, is going to gather with him 70 nations to all go against Israel. So Gog u Magog is the numerical value of 70. And in this Midrash, it says that 70 nations are going to join this king. Now, I'm just going to do a small sidetrack. This is not 70 nations, but about 10 miles from here about, maybe 15 miles from here, you have this building on the First Avenue. They call it the United Nations. They're all United Nations against Israel, by the way. <laughs> they, they called the United Nations, but they dropped part of the sentence. So the majority of them are the United Nations against Israel. So we already see how, how physically, in front of our eyes, there are a few nations that are, we'll call them now our friends, but the majority are not our friends, and they're all against us. And by the way, when I'm saying Israel, I'm not only talking about the state of Israel, I'm talking about Bnei Israel, the Jews. Don't think that the war is against the land of Israel, it's about the Jews, Bnei Israel. Now, it says that the war is going to be around Yerushalayim. Not on Yerushalayim, not in Yerushalayim, which means not in Eretz Israel. Around Yerushalayim. I don't know if you believe the news. I wouldn't believe the news because 90% of it is false. But nevertheless, the news a little bit tells you that there is a little, a little war in Syria. It's not so big. It's just a few terrorists there shooting at each other. It's not a little war. There's probably about four or 500,000 deaths in Syria, just civilians. Half of the Russian army is there. Half of the I Iran army is there. The American army is there. The Chinese army is there. The IDF is there. They're all there. I live 30 kilometers from the border. 30 kilometers. We hear sometimes the ground shaking, and it's not earthquakes. We see the jets flying sometimes. We, s we hear it. It's not that it's far away. There's a massive war going on in Syria. And they also work in Lebanon. And it's all around. It's in Iraq. It's everywhere. So this is around Yerushalayim. And, you know, around means in a, in a circle way. So also in the south, we have Azza, we have Egypt. Daesh has conquered the half of the island of Sinai. I mean, I know most people, they look at the headlines and they don't really see what's going on. But that's already, already a huge war. Now, <clears throat> going back to the Midrash, and this is going on Midrash Rabbah, on Parashat Tzav, where it says that Gog, the king, is going to come from the north and is going to come to the south. Exactly how it says in the prophecy of Yechezkel. Now, where is this Gog place? And again, I'm not going to start telling you this guy's Gog, this guy's Gog. I don't know. And like I told you, it's irrelevant. But I'm going to tell you one very interesting detail from a Midrash. And you can look up it. The Midrash is called Midrash Chazal Tzror Hamor. Where it's saying there, this is brought down by the Radak. Radak is Rabbi David Kimchi. And he explains there that about, give or take 23, 2400 years ago, a great warrior, Alexander Mokdon, he closed a city with huge walls and huge doors, and he locked in a nation in there. And this whole place is surrounded with huge walls, metal walls, and there's only one gate to this whole locked city. And there are metal guards, saying in our words it's called robots, but metal guards that are constantly pounding on the doors and on the walls. And the people inside think that they're still building the wall, but they're stuck there. That's what it's talking about, this Gog, Gog and Magog. And it's talking about walls of iron. There is a, a prophecy, in, again, also in the book of Yechezkel, 36.10, uh, where it says, Naflu ha'arim, the cities have crumbled and fall, and all the wall 
will fall. Some, say, some people say maybe it's talking about the wall in uh, eastern uh, Germany, but it's talking about the wall that's surrounding the nation of Gog and Magog. Now, we do know that it's talking about a huge, huge war. Many different sources, we're not going to get into all the sources and all the information about the, this huge war, but it says that we have in our history few, three massive, massive wars. And it's not talking about World War I, World War II. It's talking about huge wars. The first one, it's the war of Avraham Avinu, after Lot was captured, captured, and he ran after to get him, he went to war with four kings. This is the first war that it's talking about. And it's also saying how many soldiers participated in the war. The next one was the war of Sanherib, going after Chizkiyahu, the king of Yehuda. And again, there was one of the massive wars in history. And the third one is Gog and Magog. In all three wars, it says the amount of soldiers that participate in the war. You know how many? Two billion, 680 million soldiers participated in those wars. Whether it's a myth, whether it's a theory, whether it's a, a, a parable, it's not so irrelevant. It's for us to understand that it's talking about these three big wars, and they were huge, they were massive. Now, for example, if you take the structure of World War III, it might not be two billion soldiers, but it's going to be a couple millions, if not 10, 20 millions. Now, there is another Midrash brought down in Yalkut Shimoni on the book of Zechariah, Zachary, and it says there very clearly there's going to be three wars, Gog and Magog, that are going to go against Yerushalayim. And again, when it says the word Yerushalayim or the word Israel, it's talking about us, wherever we are. We can be in Germany, we can be in Israel, and we can be in America. It's not talking about the land of Israel, it's talking about against us. And it does say there very clearly in the book of Yechezkel, and it's brought down in Lakut Shimoni about these three massive wars of Gog and Magog. Very interesting, there is a Midrash about this, in this Midrash in, in Lakut Shimoni, that it says, who's Gog and Magog? It says, Gog is Afrikai ve Germania. This is a Midrash that was written 2,000 years ago. And it has the word Germania. Germania, of course, is Germany. So we already see how it's relating to the war. So we saw already 80 years ago what Germany did. Now, there are so much details, so much information, and so many prophecies and sources. We're not going to go through it tonight because really we're going to sit here for hours. We're just going to kind of summarize things so we can understand the point. There is a great, great rabbi who was the Av, the head of the Beit Din Yerushalayim. His name is Rabbi Moshe Staunbach. And Sternbach, Sternbach, he has a book that says Da Matashiv, Mashetashiv. I'm sure you're familiar with the Mishnah that it says Da Mashetashiv La Pikoros. No, you have to have enough information to answer somebody that is a Pikoros. He has a book that is called Da Mashetashiv. And he says there, in the name of another huge rabbi who's called Hagon Yechezkel Avramsky. And he says that in the name of the Gon from Vilna. This is all like a dynasty going one rabbi giving it to another rabbi. And he says there, this is unbelievable. This is a prophecy said by the Gon from Vilna. And the Gon from Vilna, Vilna wasn't here 50 years ago, over 200 years ago. And the Gon from Vilna said that in the last war, you know how long the war was going to be? 12 minutes. There wasn't a nuclear bomb 200 years ago. There wasn't jets and there wasn't anything that can imply that something can take a war, it can take 12 minutes. And the Gaon from Vilna said over 200 years ago that the last war will take exactly 12 minutes. Some say it's they, they, that, that some commentary says 20, but 20 minutes, 12 minutes, we're not going to argue now in two minutes. How can you have a war in 12 minutes? You all can imagine what kind of a war we can have in 12 minutes. All it takes is a few fingers and half the world is under a mushroom cloud. Now, interestingly here, it says there in this book, brought down by the Gaon from Vilna, Moshe Steinbach, that in this war that will take 12 minutes, third of the world will die on the spot. A third of the world will be injured, and a third will survive. 
Last that I checked, we're about 7.4 billion people in this planet. So you're talking about 2.5 billion that will die right away, 2.5 billion that will survive, will, will, sorry, will be injured, and 2.5 billion, give or take, that will survive. Now, there is a Mishnah in Mish Mishnah that's called Ediot. Not, I know it sounds like a word that is not so nice. It's called Ediot, meaning from a, 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 a testimony. This can be found in Mishnah B, Bet, and Mishnah Yud, in chapter B, uh, Mishnah Yud. And it says there that the Mishpat of Gogu Magog will take 12 months. The trial. But we're not talking about a trial in a, in a court case, meaning how long Gogu Magog will take? 12 months. Why 12 months? Because just to paint a scenario, a nuclear bomb can fall somewhere. We'll probably kill 2-3 million people. But then from radiation, starvation, uh, uh, diseases, and so forth, we'll take another month, and another month, and another month, and another month. The effect can go for at least a year. Just radiation. So the first ones, the first third, they're in the impact. They die. And then the next third will take a whole year for them to die. So we're talking about two-thirds of the population of this planet that will die in this war. <clears throat> and then, of course, one-third will survive. And you're talking about two and a half billion people. I mean, this is not like two survivors. It's, uh, and don't think that New Zealand is safe. I have a friend that ran away to New Zealand. He, he listens to me, he packed his bags, and he moved to New Zealand. He has an internet business. He's like sitting there on a beautiful beach, and, and he's all happy. He sends me pictures on this beautiful house he got, which I always tell him, you fool. If you're supposed to die, a coconut will fall from the tree all right on your head and kill you. So, but nevertheless, there's not going to be one place in this world that's going to be safe. Now, what is the point? What is the reason for this war? Even though we know that, you know, God, Hashem is called Ish Milchama, Hashem Ish Milchama is a man of war. But what's the point of the war? Why do you need this destruction and war and, and all this uh, hardship? There are five reasons for this war. First reason is, is to destroy evil. This is called Leha'avir Memshelet Zadon. To take the rulership, the leadership of evil, which is all the governments that we're dealing with, all the governments are corrupt. I can guarantee to you there's not one country in the world that the government is not corrupt. Police, uh, 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 politics, whatever it is, uh, courtrooms, courthouses, judges, is to kill all the evil people. Can you imagine how what a selective bomb is going to be, how it's going directly to the, all the evil people? This is called Lavir Memshelet Zadon, to destroy all the leadership, all the politicians, I mean the bad ones, I don't know if there's some good ones, but but uh, anything that is evil. The next thing is to c fulfill a prophecy that we say every day, Hashem lemelech al kol to prove to the entire world that we have one king, and that's God. And everybody will see with their eyes. There's not going to be a question, who did it, what did it. Everybody will see that Hashem is the boss. As we pray on Yom Kippur, that every person will realize that I am completely a creature of Hashem. That I, everybody will know the existence of God. There's not going to be such a thing as somebody doesn't believe. Everybody will believe after what they see with their own eyes. The third, this is called Nekama Bagoim. Uh, revenge on the nations that went against us for the last four or five thousand years. Any nation, any person that went against the nation of the Jews, there's going to be a nekama, there's going to be a revenge. Shem will take their blood back. The fourth one is that every, everything that was taken away from us as a nation, in the Holocaust, we were robbed. Forget about being murdered. We were robbed from our houses, from our jewelry, from anything. Paintings, history, whatever it is. If it's the Spanish Inquisition, whatever it is. Anything that was taken from us will be given back. So all these treasures that were taken from us will be returned to the rightful owners. And the fa fifth reason for this war, and this is where you need to hold the chair, is to make a selection in the nation of the Jews who's going to stay. Because some will not stay. And this is mainly 
the reason why we want to talk about it, because you need to constantly ask yourself, am I going to survive this war? We already have the revenge on the nations, we have everything else. But am I going to survive this war? This is the first reason, re, fifth reason for the war. And part of the nation will survive. And these are going to be the ones who did tshuva. It says, Mi Any person that will do tshuva, real tshuva, then will survive. And the ones who don't do tshuva, Ye'abed, will have to leave the world. And tshuva, we're not going to have time now to talk about tshuva. I have a lot of classes online what it means tshuva. There's a beautiful CD outside with 25 or 26 lectures about tshuva. Tshuva is not to just put a yamaka on your head and come to the shul once a week. And tshuva is not about saying, I love Hashem. Okay, I love Hashem too, but what do you do about it? Tshuva is tshuva, is that you repent and you are devoted to the Torah. And we'll talk about it soon. You know what's the unbelievable, an unbelievable ashgacha pratit that I prepared my notes today, what I want to say, what's the most important thing, I mean I only have about an hour, an hour and a half to give over the, the information, I have information for five, fifteen hours, and I noticed something unbelievable, and everything happens by Ashgaha Pratit. We planned this uh, visit about a water, three, four weeks ago, and uh, when I contacted Yaakov, where, where, when are we doing the lecture in uh, Great Neck, then it worked out that today is going to be the lecture Sunday. I don't know if you notice which parasha we're in. We're in parashat Vayechi. This is the first parasha in the Torah that there's a clear notice about the redemption. In this week's parasha, Yaakov tells his boys, Come and gather around me. I will tell you what's going to be in the end of days. In this parasha. And this is the day we decided to do the lecture. Now we already have prophecies already in Sefer Bereshit about the coming of, of Mashiach. In, in, in the, I'm talking about Parashat Bereshit, in Parashat Noach. But here it's clear that Yaakov Avinu says clearly, in, it's in the Torah, it's not a commentary. It's not Kabbalah or Zohar. It's in the Torah, it says, Come and let me tell you what's going to be in Acharit Ha'emim. And you know what the Midrash says about that? That Yaakov was about to tell them, how Gog and Magog will, will, will crumble and fall. Yaakov was about to tell them when Mashiach is coming, who's Mashiach, how it's going to happen. And then you know what? This is says in the Talmud, can be found attracted Pesachim, that he was about to give them all this information. His, he lost his thought. How many times it happens to you? You're about to say something and you lose your chain of thought. But Yaakov Avinu is a prophet. He's not the type of person that forgets. Yaakov Avinu just made a quick calculation. What good would it be if I tell them what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, when it's going to happen. And I gave all this information very, very thoroughly in the other lecture about Mashiach. I don't want to waste our time right now. Now, why am I saying that? Because first of all, it's unbelievable divine providence, what we call Hashgaha Prati, that today is the lecture, today is the parasha. But we do have a lot of prophecies in the Torah itself. Because I know a lot of people say, Listen, if it's in the Navi, if it's in Tanakh, if it's in the Gemara, eh, I want to see in the Torah. So this is the prophecy in the Torah about the coming of Mashiach, about this war. And we have another prophecy in the Torah. If you remember, in Parashat Beha'alotcha, it says, Vayisharu shnei anashim bamachane. Two men stayed in the camp. Who are these two men? Eldad Meidad. And they started prophesying, prophes having prophecies. What did they have prophecy about? The Talmud in Masechet Sanhedrin said they were prophesy, prophesying about all the war of Gog and Magog. That's what the prophecy that they had. <clears throat> so we know that also in the Torah it's already mentioning and we have prophecy about this final war. Now, a lot of the prophecies are in the books of the prophets like Yechezkel and Zechariah and Ovadia and Malachi and so forth. But we also have prophecies from very close to us. I mentioned the Gon from Vilna, who has a lot of prophecies. And there's another great tzaddik that people in our generation, generation actually saw him. And this is the Chafetz Chaim, who lived not too long ago. He has a lot of prophecies too. He has a prophecy that 
When World War I started, everybody came to him. He was alive at the time. And at the time, he says, this is the first Gogo Magog. We're going to have three Gogo Magogs. World War I is the first Gogo Magog. And there wasn't internet, there wasn't Facebook, there wasn't news, but they knew that there's a massive war. Everybody was afraid. They went to the tzaddik of the generation, one of the many tzaddikim, but they went to the Chafetz Chaim, and they told him, Rebbe, where is a safe place for us to run? So he answered by quoting a prophecy from the book of, Hosh of Ovadiah, chapter 1, verse 17. And in the mountain of Zion, that's where we're going to be the most safest place. And whoever's going to be there is going to be separated. You know what he told him in other words? Israel is the only safe place. And you see that World War I never reached Israel. He also said, this was brought down by a rabbi called Yechezkel Lowenstein. He was the mashgiach of the yeshiva called Ponovich. And he said in the name of the Chafetz Chaim, Chafetz Chaim is less than a hundred years ago. Well, no, yeah, a little bit less than a hundred years ago. About. He said that also in the name of the great student of Chafetz, the Chafetz Chaim, Elchanan Wasserman, there is a book called Midrash Shochar Tov. And this Midrash is on the Tehillim. This can be found on Tehillim Kuf Yud Chet, 118, verse uh, 32, where it says there that we're going to have three Gogumagogs. Three wars that are called Gogumagog. It's not one war, it's three wars. And not only that, this is also brought down by the Malbin on the prophecy of Yechezkel, in the prophecy in chapter 32, verse 69. And he also says there, there's going to be three Gogo Magogs. It's important for us to know that there are, there are three big wars. Why is it so important to us to know? Because World War I was the first Gogo Magog. And when World War I erupted, then, then the Chafetz Chaim said, this is the first Gogo Magog. At the time, the Chafetz Chaim had a prophecy and he says, in 25 years, it's going to be the second Gog and Magog. It's all documented and noted. Sure enough, exactly 25 years between World War I and World War II. 1914, 1939. Then, he said, 70 years after the second Gog and Magog will be the third Gog and Magog. 1945-2015. There's a war in Syria that is in the scale of Gog and Magog. This, by the way, can be found in a book called Lev Eliyahu. I know a lot of people question these sources. This can be found in a book called Lev Eliyahu on Parashat Yitro. Now, there's also a Kabbalah from Rabbi Hanan, uh, 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 El Hanan Wasserman brought from the Chafetz Chaim that there's going to be ten Shemitot from the first, second Gog Magog to the, second go, to, to the third Gog Magog. Shemitah is seven years. If you remember, if you look back in history, the year the Holocaust ended was the year of Shemitah. Count 10 Shemitot after that, 70 years, 2015. Now, and by the way, all this that I'm telling you is also backed up by another two huge rabbis that are, are students of the, uh, uh, associated with uh, uh, the Chafetz Chaim, Eliyahu Shwei, and Aaron Kotler. This is all, I'm just throwing a little bit of details because I really don't want to stop to too many sources. Now, a lot of people think that in Syria it's just a bunch of uh, 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 terrorists from Daesh running around there. It's not a bunch of terrorists, it's just a cover-up. You know that about a year and a half ago, half of the Russian Navy came and parked in front of the Syrian uh, 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 shores. In front of Syria is parked many, but one of them is the most lethal, deadly Russian submarine in the world. The name of the submarine is Dimitri. Go and Google it tonight. You'll see what's the, what's the submarine. Has enough nuclear power on it to destroy the world. How much nuclear bombs it has on it. Why do you need a nuclear submarine if you're fighting Daesh? Daesh is a bunch of hooligans running on, on, the, on the mountains with jeeps. Why would you need a nuclear submarine? Why do you need aircraft carriers? Why do you need dozens of, of ships? Because the war already in Syria started. You might not see it. You might just see here and there an attack. It's a war. It's a huge war. And all the armies are gathering there closer and closer. 
They say there are already hundreds of thousands of uh, 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 soldiers from Iran on the borders of Lebanon and Syria. I mean, the war is very, very, very serious. Now, <clears throat> we're going to get to that in a second too. But we want to go back to this Gog -go Magog. Because we said that the fifth reason of Gog -go Magog is who's going to survive. It's less important right now the details, which army is where and who's attacking who. Later on we'll get into those details because it's also important to know. You should not think for one second that uh, there's nothing going on in Syria. But I want to go more and emphasize about the point of who's going to be the ones who are going to survive this war. Remember number five, the reason of the, of the war? This is brought, brought down by the Radak. Radak is the acronym of Rabbi David Kimchi. He brings uh, uh, this information <coughs> brought on the book of Yoel, chapter 3, verse hey, 5, talking about Gog and Magog. And it says, Rabbi Mi Israel Yechelu, many from Israel, and it's not talking about Eretz Israel, talking about Bnei Israel, will perish and die. Vehakedoshim, and the holy ones. Veyerei Hashem, and the ones who are fearing God, Yimaleto, they will run away. They will, be, they will survive. Later on we're going to talk and define exactly what it means, who's the Kedoshim, and who's the ones who are Yerei Hashem. The ones who have beards doesn't mean that they're God-fearing. I know many people with beards and suits and hats, and they're not God-fearing at all. It's just playing Purim every day. The Gaon from Vilna says very clearly, that if we do tshuva, then the redemption will come exactly like the prophecy of Yeshaya, and that is bechesed v'berachamim. It's going to come with kindness, soft, nice, no wars, no problems. But we have to do tshuva for that. And again, tshuva is not just putting a yamaka on your head and coming to shul once a week. That's very nice of you. That's not tshuva. So if we do tshuva as a nation, and I'm going to give you a secret and a side note. We don't need all the nation. We need a strong group. Can't make everybody do tshuva, but we still need a very strong group. Then we have a clear prophecy that the redemption will come soft. And trust me, you should be praying every day, all day, that that's how it should come. But, chas v'shalom, if we don't do tshuva, there is a prophecy in the book of Hosea, chapter 10, verse 8, that it says, Leharim naflu aleinu. The mountains are all going to fall on us. This is talking about a war that is going to be a destruction. This is not talking about a few men jumping with M16s. It's not going to be even soldiers. Talking about war of missiles, war of bombs, that everything is going to fall down and collapse and crumble. Now, very, very interesting. I'm hoping that you're following where I'm going with it. Because don't focus so much right now on the war. You have to focus on how you, how you survive, not the war. There is a, a book written by Chafetz Chaim. And the book is called Tzipita Le Yeshua. Have you expected the redemption? Did you live for the redemption? You know, that's where it's one of the 13 principles that you have to believe in. That I have to believe that Mashiach is coming any day. If you don't believe in that, you don't have a chalek to More than that, this was brought down by the Midrash, that we know that when a person dies, he goes up to the heavens. He goes to his uh, court case. They ask him questions. The first question they ask the soul is, have you dealt business honestly? Hey, masakta beyosher. We all do business, even if you're not a business owner. You can be uh, an employee, but you can still steal from your boss. You can take staples, and you can take, uh, I don't know, papers from the printer, or use the phone. The first question is, Haim asakta beyoshel. Now you can completely dissect now this whole idea. We're not going to get into it, but I can give you a hint that it's not only talking about business. It means if I was honest, if I was a man of truth. Yoshel, Yoshel means truth, man, woman. Don't, don't, don't think I'm segregating. The first question they are caring about in the world above is if you are honest. If you're honest to other people, if you're honest to yourself, if you're honest to Hashem, it's all about honesty. The Torah is called Emet. Moshe is called Emet. The seal of Hashem is called Chotam HaEmet. It's all Emet. If you're living a life of a lie, sorry to tell you, Lo Asakta Beyosher. You didn't deal in the world here with Yosher, with integrity, honesty. 
and being truthful. The second question they ask the Neshama when it comes up to Shamaim, Haim kavat aitim la Torah. Have you set times to learn Torah? You, nobody's expecting you to learn five hours a day in a, in a yeshiva. Nobody's expecting you to be Rabbi Kanievsky. But did you set times to learn? Even if it's once a week. Once a week, one hour, come to learn Torah in the shul. Once a week is nothing between us. Minimum two hours a day, minimum. That's not to, to warm up the engines. And I'm talking about any person. And don't look at me like two hours. <laughs> You know why I'm telling you don't look at me like that? Because you're two hours on Facebook. So at least be two hours and learn Torah. So two hours is nothing. What's two hours? Half an hour in the morning, an hour in the afternoon, half an hour at night. What can you do in two hours? But nevertheless, they asked the Neshama, have you set time to learn Torah? And now I'll give you a discount for a second. Okay, even if it's once a week, but did you have set times? And the third question they ask the person when he comes to the heavenly court, Haim Tzipita Yeshua. Have you waited, longing for the redemption to come? And you think you can lie in the heavenly court and say, Yeah, of course, <laughs> what are you talking about? Every day! <laughs> Who are you kidding? You didn't even think about it. So these are the three questions they ask the soul when it comes to the heavenly court. And the third one is the one that we want to focus on. Tzipita le Yeshua. Let's support means to have expectations. It's not just to say, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's to want it. And every second to want it. You know why everybody in this planet, everybody including you, are suffering from hardships? Everybody in this room. If we make now a vote, I guarantee to you not even one person will raise their hand if I ask you, is your life smooth and perfect? Yeah. One will say, yeah, Baruch Hashem, I'm married, but Parnasa is very bad. Another person will say, I have good Parnasa, but I don't have a wife. And one will say, I have kids, but they don't listen to me. And everybody has some type of a hardship. And some people come, hardships are coming in, in dozens. Everybody has hardships. And it's not the only one. You're not the only one. People think I'm the only one who has a problem. You're not the only one. Everybody is going through financial struggles. Every, I mean, even though I know it's very confusing. Because you come to certain places, everybody's driving beautiful BMWs. But everybody, is, it's, on, it's on the credit. It's on the, you know, I owe the bank 100000 and my house is in foreclosure already for three years. That's what I hear all the time, echoing from all directions. On the outside, it looks very nice and, uh, how they say here? Bling, shiny. But I look like a wall. I look like the wailing wall, like the picture here. Everybody comes to talk to me and whisper. And everybody tells me, listen, I don't know what to do. The bank is calling me five times a day. I have like 150,000 on credit cards. My house, they're going to throw me out of there. I didn't pay my mortgage for three years. I owe people money. You think you're, you think you're the only one? And everybody tells me the same thing. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> okay, I won't tell anybody, but everybody's the same. And if it's not the financial part, how many people are single, can't get married? How many mothers cannot get pregnant? How many people cannot find their other half? How many people, their children are completely running around the world, go, going crazy? We know why. Because we have a leash on our neck. Because we are, uh, Kadosh Baruch wants us to be under pressure. You know when you pray? When you have pressure. When you're sitting on a yacht, you don't pray. You're enjoying the sun. But when you're under pressure, Hashem, Hashem, I'll do whatever you want. Just get me out of this court case. So we all have pressure, some type of pressure. Don't think you're the only one here. And I'm telling you, it's coming from all different directions only. So you can start praying and longing for the redemption. People come to me, I have problems with Parnasa, with my livelihood. What should I do? I tell them, pray for Mashiach. Oh, pray for Mashiach. I need a check. Pray for Mashiach. Uh, you know, I have health problems. Pray for Mashiach. But Mashiach is not a doctor. But pray for him to come because when he comes, all the problems are solved. There's not going to be problems anymore. In this book that the Chafetz Chaim wrote, it's called Tzipita Le Yeshua. It says there's something very, very powerful. It says that in the time of Mitzrayim, there were ten plagues. Now we're going to next week, Parashat Shemot. We're getting into it. Now it has to be very <coughs> vibrant in our eyes. It says there that there were ten plagues. The plague number eight was the plague that was called darkness. Three days in the plague of darkness, you know what happened? 
All the Jews that did not want to leave Mitzrayim died. I'm calling them Jews, even though they weren't called Jews yet. They were called Jews way later. But we're relating with the word Jews. But in the three days of the darkness, the plague was seven days, but three days, it says that Kol Bnei Israel, the only ones that did not want to leave, died. Why in the darkness? So the Egyptians will not see us dying and saying, hey, the plague is affecting them too. You know how many people died in Egypt? 80% of the population did not leave Egypt. Now we know that about 3 million people left, which means 12 million died. You know why they didn't want to leave Mitzrayim? Why they died there? This is brought down in, in this book, Tzipit Aleshua, and many other places. They couldn't let go of the... No, they didn't let go of the physicality, of the materialism. They couldn't let go of the iPhone. They didn't know what to do to go on the journey or to leave the iPhone. No, 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 I'm staying with the iPhone. Maybe I'll get a text message. Maybe I'll get... Real estate, the cars, doesn't matter. They were too attached to the physicality. And that caused them to die. That's why they died then. They didn't die because they didn't believe in Hashem. They didn't be die because they didn't believe in Moshe Rabbeinu. And can you imagine seeing Moshe Rabbeinu doing these moftim, these miracles, seeing the miracles with your own eyes, and you're saying, oh, Torah, iPhone, Torah, iPhone. I mean, I'm saying it in a joke. It's not even funny. Because we are in the same place exactly. Nothing changed. The only difference is that we have iPhones and no, they didn't. So we do know that the ones who did not leave Egypt are the ones who did not want to separate from the materialism. And in our generation, do you know any people, many people that are leaving the materialism? You know what's the joke here? That most people that are holding to the materialism here, they have no materialism. You know what, if you were sitting on 50 million dollars, I would say, you know, you have materialism. But if you owe that money to the credit card company, or to the bank, or to the what, there's no, you don't own anything. So what are you holding on? Something that doesn't exist. Okay, so one out, maybe one in this room, is I'm not hitting exactly on the spot, and they have a little bit of money in their savings account. But I'm talking in general, and please don't take my words out of context in saying he's talking just about that. I'm talking about the concept that if it's not the iPhone, if it's not the BMW, it's the clothes, it's the purse, it's the Gucci, it's the Muchi, whatever it is. It's this materialism. It's me sitting in a restaurant right now. Why do you have to sit in a $500 restaurant, eat just something for $10, eat something healthy, and give that money to charity? I'm not saying something wrong going to a restaurant with your wife, but I'm just saying the, the, this mind block but the materialism, that's what caused them to die in Mitzrayim. Now, why am I saying that? There is a book, it's called the SMAK. SMAK is the acronym of Sefer Mitzvot Katan. He says there that the redemption of Egypt, that's for us to learn about the future redemption. Whatever happened in Egypt is going to have a rerun in our time. There's going to be a Moshe Rabbeinu, we call him Melech HaMashiach, there's going to be moftim, there's going to be miracles, that it says, meaning, what I showed you in Mitzrayim is nothing compared to what you're going to see now, the miracles we're going to see. And the smack says that, that it's a replica. Mitzrayim, the going out of Mitzrayim is for us to see what happened and to understand that's what's going to happen. So one on one. There was a Moshe Rabbeinu, we have Mashiach. There's going to be a miracle, there was miracles, we're going to have miracles too. Some left and some didn't, same thing here. Some will survive and some won't. Now, if a smart person wants to see what to do, they look at the history. You look at the history and you learn from our mistakes. Now, one thing that it says here in the smack in the book, that it says the ones who don't long for the Geula, the ones who don't expect it, they just live their day, every day, these are the ones who are not going to leave. Now there's nothing wrong with planning ahead, but sometimes I see people that I talk to them and they tell me in five years I'm going to go to college and ten years later and twenty years later, you're obviously not waiting for the redemption, you're waiting for, your, for whatever, whatever plan you have. 
Now don't get me wrong, it's nothing wrong with going and learning and starting a business that we're doing, but if you're really expecting the redemption, it's not about opening a business right now. Somebody emailed me a few days ago, should I open, I have money, this and that, should I do a startup? In the... I told him, a startup? A startup? Take that money, move to Israel, sit in yeshiva and learn all day long Torah and start learning. A startup. Nevertheless, it says there, and interestingly, there's another book called Ori Chezkel, but it says there that the ones who don't expect, don't desire the redemption will not be re 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 redeemed. And there's, in this book, Ori Chezkel, that can be found in chapter 3, page 70, uh, and it says there, very, very interesting, it says the exact same thing. In order to be redeemed in the redemption, you have to wait for it and believe in it and want it. Very, very sad, you know, it says in the Zohar, this can be found in Parashat Shmot, that it says there very, in a lot of details, what's going to happen at the time of the redemption, to over 2,000 years ago. And it says there that we're going to have 15 days of darkness when before Mashiach comes in this huge war. 15 days of darkness. First of all, why? Because there's going to be a lot of people who are going to die. Then comes the question, how? <laughs> how? You know, a, a sky covered with a mushroom cloud, that's darkness. There are many ways of darkness. You know when it hit me the first time? Last year, I was on a tour, and my last stop was Florida. We land in Florida, my daughter was with me, beautiful sun, everybody's, you know, happy. And I see people are running like maniacs. What's going on with these uh, people here in South Florida? After a couple hours that, are, hours that I'm there, I'm talking to my wife and she tells me, didn't you hear? There's a, a hurricane coming to Florida. A Category 6 hurricane. Get out of there! I'm like, no, it's fine. Don't worry. Uh, I have two lectures and my flight is on Thursday. Don't worry. The hurricane is scheduled for Motzei Shabbat. I'm going to be already long gone. I'm going to be with you in Eretz Israel when they're here under the attack of the hurricane. People were running there like chicken heads, buying water, flashlights, boarding the walls, the, the windows. And my daughter and me are like walking like, ah, you know, everybody's like running around and we're just sitting having a cup of coffee. Because in my mind, my flight is on, on Thursday, I'm out. There were about 850 flights of JetBlue leaving Florida. One flight got canceled. Mine. <laughs> it wasn't funny a year ago. One flight gets canceled and that's my flight. And I'm like, excuse me? Why would you cancel a flight going out? Cancel a flight coming in? Took about 10, 15, 20 hours that we were starting to look around. Can I buy a ticket? Yeah, for about $7,000. Maybe on a waiting list and probably the, you know, a waiting list of about 3,000 3, people. Okay, let me drive out of Florida. There was like a 22-hour uh, traffic jam on the I-95. Cars were just standing. Nobody's moving. Calling to a hotel? Hotel? <laughs> yeah. Hey, what do you mean a Hotel. Long story short, we got stuck in Florida. In Hurricane Irma, Baruch Hashem, it turned out to be a less uh, destructive than what it was. It went a little bit to the more west side of Florida. That's less the point. The point was that from Shabbat till Tuesday, there wasn't electricity. The electricity went down. The airport got hurt. I only left on Wednesday. Four days without electricity. It was like 190 degrees there. I... I I almost uh, 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 disappeared, a hundred kilos just evaporated in sweat. I mean, there's no air conditioning there and the, the, the humidity is like 5,000%. I was just sitting in the tub with water and, and there's no electricity. The food slowly, slowly starts running out. There's air, there, there's no air conditioning. Uh, we were really paralyzed from the heat. And the, 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 the freezer is starting to melt, so there's nothing there. At night, we went out pitch black, pitch black. We didn't have phones, so we went driving around with the car 
looking maybe we'll find some phone service. Miles over miles over miles that you're driving in pitch black, you don't even see anything. And I was like, wow, look at that darkness. The next day after the hurricane, when we went out of the house, trees are everywhere, cars are upside down, everything is destroyed, and I was like, wow, look at that. That's how it's going to look after the bombs fall. Darkness, no food, no phones, no communication. My wife is worried sick. She doesn't hear from me. Four days. No electricity. No phones. No nothing. We're already eating crumbs and fighting over a little cup of water. I mean, I was making it dramatic, but that's when it hit me. I was like, wow. <laughs> Fifteen days of darkness. Now, I'm just going to sidetrack a, li a, a, a little bit specifically on this 15 days of darkness, if it says in the Zohar, that's what's going to happen. It's not a parable. It says there's going to be 15 days of darkness in the go in Gog and Magog. There's going to be 50 days of darkness for the Rashaim to die. But a lot of times when I talk to people and I tell them, listen, I know that. There are many others that know that. And now I told you that also the Chafetz Chaim gave us a prophecy. The only safe place is Israel. And a lot of people tell me, I understand that Israel will be attacked. Here in America, who's going to attack us? Sure. Well, the Americans have the most enemies. And first of all, millions of them are already in the country. They're part of the citizens. They're good citizens. They're lawyers. They're doctors. They're now in Congress. They go five times a day to the mosque. And they're just multiplying and just waiting for the day they're going to get the green light and you're going to have 30,000, 30 million Muslims running in the streets here. I just saw a video a few weeks ago, some guy, an honest bypass, a Jewish guy, walks in Borough Park, a Muslim car, a, a, a taxi driver, goes out and beats him almost to death. You think it was just a moment of insanity? You think it was a coincidence? You think it was just a, oh, by the way, no, I don't like how you look. Mr. Lowenstein. No. So I'm not talking right now about the enemies within this country. I'm talking about one scenario. I mean, there's many scenarios how this country can be attacked. One scenario, I've been saying that already for years. And this is not something that I'm inventing. This is something that they were trying to pass laws in Congress about it. America has many enemies. North Korea, Russia, China, Iran, many others. These are enemies that they want to annihilate America too. You know what they call America is the big devil and Israel is the small devil. Now how do you attack America? The great nation of America. What, do you throw a, a nuclear bomb from the sky? That's impossible. A plane will not be able to come closer to America and drop a bomb. And even if they do, so one city goes down. Then the after effect is devastating. But there's one way how this country can be attacked. It's called EMP. EMP stands for Electric Magnetic Pulse. All it takes is one stinky missile. It doesn't have to be such a sophisticated missile. One missile that carries a nuclear bomb on it that is detonated out of the atmosphere and in a radius of three, 4,000 miles, anything that has electronics in it fries on the spot. Anything that has electronics that fries. It doesn't stop. It fries, burns to ashes. You know what that means? 50,000 airplanes that are flying over the land of America in one second fall down. No electronics. No cell phones, no cars. Cars don't start. There's no electricity. No electricity, no ambulance, no hospitals, no phones, no refrigerators, no nothing. How do you do it? You don't even have to, miss to, to launch it from Iran. You don't need a long-range missile. You need to put it on a ship. A regular ship. You know, I now landed a few days ago. The f when the plane lands before New York, New York is, I mean, on the ocean, with my own eyes, I saw dozens, if not hundreds of freight ships on the ocean, uh, two miles from the shore, 10 miles from the shore, 50 miles, dozens of them. How can, you know, how many, how many thousands of ships are in front of the shores of America? All you need is one little ship standing 100 miles from the shore, like a converter will open a roof, a missile goes out, they launch it within 10 seconds, and this whole country is back to the 1800. One little bomb. Now, if you think I'm cuckoo, just go to Google, go to YouTube, write EMP. 
Look what it is. You know that Congress tried to pass a law that they should try to build different fields that will protect it, generators. It didn't pass the law. You know what they did with those millions of billions of dollars? They built underground cities for the elite that when this happens, they go under the ground and they sit there happy. And here, everybody is fighting for their life. So you can go three, four days without electricity, but then the food runs out. And then the supermarket was already robbed a long time ago. And then it's a danger zone to go out to the street. Because everything that moves in the street will be robbed, will be mugged, will be attacked. It says that if Chas Shalom and EMP hits the United States within about one year, 90% of the population of the United States will die. From starvation, from diseases, there's no sewage, there's no nothing. Everything shuts down. So this is one scenario out of many how even this great country can be attacked. And this is not some theory, and a lot of people say, wow, you are, I don't know what movies you're watching, you seem a little bit cuckoo. <laughs> it's not that I'm inventing anything, it's not that I'm off the edge. And again, can be the people, there are the people that says, you are completely nuts. You, I don't even know what, you're maybe sitting in some beach and smoking opium, I don't even know what's going on in your mind. Where are you coming up with all this nonsense? So you have the choice of believing or not. You can say that I'm crazy and, and then, and then, and then, I don't want to tell you and then. Now, why am I telling you that? Because if the Zohar says there's going to be 15 days of darkness after this war or during the war, there are many ways how there's going to be darkness here. Now, <coughs> the ones who did not want to leave Mitzrayim, I told you they were the ones who were holding on the physicality, on the materialism. Who are the ones who are not going to survive this war? First of all, the wicked ones. The ones who are wicked, they go against Hashem. The ones who are not God-fearing. The ones who are stuck on materialism. The ones that are thinking only about their physical pleasures. You know that most people, all they're thinking about is their physical pleasure. Doesn't matter in what way it comes. It can come in alcohol, can come in drugs, can come in marital relations, can come in gambling, can come in many different ways. One thing that I noticed, this is something I've been saying already for years, nobody seems to listen. You know what's one thing, how we treat our body and we have a lot of pleasure? It's called food. Everybody likes going to restaurants. Tonight we're having sushi. Tomorrow we're going to have chops. We're all pleasuring ourselves with food. Very few people, they just eat a little bit to, to survive and that's it. Now, is it bad to eat? No. There's no prohibition to eat. Is there a mitzvah to eat? No. There's a mitzvah to eat on Shabbat. On Shabbat, you can go the whole nine yards. During the week, there's no mitzvah to eat in a restaurant or to pleasure yourself. I said that many years ago. I still say that. Many people choose to, to, to ignore me. You know that the majority of the food that you're eating that you think it's kosher, it's not kosher. You think it's kosher. It's not really kosher. How many restaurants are in New York that are kosher? A thousand restaurants? Let's say probably 80% of them are not kosher. They're either opened on Shabbat, they're either run by non-Jews, they're either the, the food that they buy is not kosher. I always give an example, I'm not going to get into it too much, I have a whole lecture online talking about it. One time I went to a restaurant, because somebody told me it's a very kosher restaurant, come and eat there, don't worry, it's a... I come, I see huge signs, kasher, shomer Shabbat. Kemach Yashan, Kemach Hadash, Kemach Beinoni, Kemach Lavan, all these stickers, Yashan, Hadash, all these slogans that nobody even know what it means. Mashgiach, no Mashgiach. Okay, mm -hmm. it's very convincing, right? I sit down, and to go and wash my hands, I go to the bathroom. The bathroom is next to the kitchen. I peek in the kitchen, and out of curiosity, the place didn't smell so kosher. I go to the cook, and I tell him, where's the Mashgiach? He tells me, who? <laughs> I told him, mashgiach. He's mash mashmish, mashmot. <laughs> I told him, mashgiach, supervisor. The rabbi, you don't have something like that. I told him, is there anybody come to check the kitchen? No. Check the kitchen? What's wrong with the kitchen? <laughs> I told him, you, you seem like a very nice guy. He was from a Spanish descent. I told him, who turns on the ovens? Me. You turn on the ovens? Who turns on the gas? Me. Nobody here comes to turn on the ovens? No. So what makes this place kosher? 
Oh, he shows me the products. See? Has a you. <laughs> you think I care that the salt is kosher? You turn the oven. <laughs> I don't want to order now. It's a dairy restaurant. I want to order now a scrambled egg. Do you check the egg? Check the egg. It's an egg. I said, do you check it? You have to check if there's bread in there. No. And with my omelet will come a salad. Do you check the lettuce? Check the lettuce. What are you talking about? They're like, what makes your place kosher? Well, may you open on Shabbat? Oh, no. I come three hours before the end of Shabbat to open up and start cleaning. But we only open the door after Shabbat. So the place is open on Shabbat. So what makes you kosher? Then once a year, some fake rabbi comes and gets $10,000 and he gives you a certification. Rabbi so-and-so made it kosher. And you see people there with beards and yarmulkes, <laughs> eating like, excuse me for the effects, but eating like there's no tomorrow. And you pass by, you see people with yarmulkes and beards, oh, of course it's kosher. And you're being fed junk. I'm not talking about now meat. Meat, don't even get me started with meat. 90% of the meat in the world is not kosher. And I, had, I have many classes not online. But 90%, listen to what I'm saying, of the meat is not kosher. And I'll give you a few examples out of many. First of all, if the animal was tortured before it was slaughtered, it cannot be kosher. And the animals, how they're grown in this generation, are in cages. They're, they're, they're injected with hormones and all sorts of junk and antibiotics. And they live like this and they're tortured and they beat up. And the funny thing is that people are saying, you know, the, the, the red meat, that I don't touch, but chicken I do. Chickens are more not kosher than the red meat. You know that the halakha says that if a bird, a kosher bird, chicken, a duck, turkey, if it falls from a height of one meter, it needs to flap its wings to stop the, the impact. If it did not flap its wings to stop the impact from a height of a meter, the bird is not kosher. I don't know if you've ever been to a kosher plant or they're coming with the trucks and they're just throwing the crates from the truck. That's way more than a meter, and the birds don't flap their wings. There's a great rabbi in Eretz Yisrael, Rav Amnon Yitzchak, who did a whole documentary, hired undercover people with undercover cameras going into all these mashchetot, to the slaughterhouses, where he interviews the slaughterers, and they say, yeah, I have to slaughter 800 chickens a day. How can you slaughter 800 chickens a day? It can't be. There's no chance that it's kosher. And this is just one example out of many. So, 90%, and people think I'm completely out of, of my charts, but that's not, that's not the reality. If you worry about your spiritual health, then you have to look into the food that you're buying. I'm not talking about now nutrition, that don't even get me into that. But the point I'm talking about now is the kosher. And why am I saying that? Because to be Yeresh mind, to fear God, you cannot have fear of God if you're not eating kosher. If a person doesn't believe in Hashem for any other type of way, it's because he's not eating kosher. If a person has doubts in Hashem, it's because he's not eating kosher. If a person has a yetzer that is out of control for forbidden relations, which is 99% of this planet, it's because they're not eating kosher. Everything is because of your food. Now, if you're not eating kosher, your mind is going to be distorted and dirty, excuse my language. Your behavior is going to be animalistic. All day long you want to procreate or to enjoy marital relations. It's called Arayot. I know it's a PG-13 tonight, but you have to understand what's going on. If you, are, if you feel that your mind is out of control, then you have to check the system. If a person eats 100% kosher, he doesn't have unpure thoughts. Yeah, he sees an attractive woman, but right away the head moves around. Okay, she's a woman, big deal. Big deal. It means I have to go out of my skin now to jump because a woman is wearing high heels. Oh! Most of the people in this planet, look at the desires and the lusts that they have. You backtrack it for kosher. When I became observant, that's the first thing I did, eating kosher. Put yourself in a test. Go one month. Crazy kosher. Go on a crazy diet. You'll see you're going to be flying. You're going to be praying. You're going to be in a different atmosphere when you pray. Curses will not come out of your mouth. You're going to look at the other gender. You're not going to desire that person. And many other things. I'm telling you, put yourself to the test. And you know why I'm saying that? Because only the ones who are God-fearing will leave this war, will survive this war. And how can you be God-fearing if you're eating trefot all day long? 
And it doesn't matter how long your beard is. And I'm not going to start going into how corrupt all the kosher certifications. I know people, a lot of people are not going to like me. And I don't really care. It's all mafia. In America, it's not that bad. In Israel, it's even worse. Not too long ago, I, I, I had a, somebody gave me something to drink. I looked at the model. Seven certification it had. Why? Why do you need to pay seven different organizations? Because this group will not have this rabbi certification, and that group will not have that rabbi certification. It was soda water. Why do you need seven certification for that? I mean, you, under, you, you, you see where I'm going with that? We had a, a big argument. When I lived in America, my daughter was in a school, a religious school, of course, and we didn't want them to feed our kids. So we sent them with our food. The school didn't accept our food. We have a problem with kashrut. I told them, you have a problem with kashrut? You don't believe me that I'm sending with my daughter a kosher shah sandwich? We don't want you to feed my daughter because all you feed her is junk. It's fake food, what they feed in schools. They let them drink Coca-Cola. This should be illegal. Coca-Cola should be illegal. I don't know who drinks, who in the right mind drinks Coca-Cola. It's, it's not even a beverage. The question is if to save in Shakoni Abed or on it. Coca-Cola, Coke. And we were arguing with the school. We don't want your food. What, what's in your food? All sorts of weird things. MSG and GMO and all sorts of food that you can't even chew. It's not really food. And one time we had a big argument where a few families went to go against the board of the school. Baruch Hashem, we moved to Israel. I didn't have to continue with that. And one time we, we gathered a group of a few, a few people and we went to a, a great Beidin and we were saying, how can it be that Coca-Cola can get a certification? I don't care if it's kosher. It's, this is a killer. Why would the rabbinical authorities even give a certification for that? Now try to go against OU now to remove a certification. You know what a loss of money means to remove a certification from Coca-Cola? You're talking about millions of dollars. All these companies, these are, it's all mafia. It's all mafia. Who gets more money? Who gets more control? I know they have nice beards and hats. And, ooh, ooh, they look very, very holy. They know the Talmud and they know the Shulchan Aruch. But that's all fake. It's all money. It's all corruption. And we're buying that. We buy all that. I lived once in a neighborhood. That's how ridiculous it was. The Beit Din had an argument, so the Beit Din split. One rabbi was sitting in this uh, office, the other rabbi was sitting in that office. Half the community went after that rabbi, so they didn't shop in the pizzeria of this guy, and the other community went with this rabbi, so they didn't shop with that pizzeria. That's not kashur, that's called politics. That's called deception and corruption. And this is just one point out of many. Because I've been saying that for years, Baruch Hashem, there are many other rabbis, I wouldn't say many, a few, a few, but they also say the same. And we do know, we're going to get to it in a second. You know, it says in the Zohar Chadash, in the Tikkuni Zohar, this was brought down by the Gaon from Vilna. First of all, it's, uh, he says that the Hevlei Mashiach, the suffering before Mashiach is going to come, is going to take 70 years. Exactly like the uh, uh, Chafetz Chaim said, it will be 70 years uh, between the second, uh, uh, Gog and Gog and the third. But you know what it says in Tikkuni Azor? It says that at the time before Mashiach is going to come, the leadership, the heads of the nation are all going to be Erev Rav. Erev Rav means people who look like me with beards and yarmulkes. They know the Torah inside out, but it's all corruption. It's all power. It's mafia. It's control. It's Erev Rav. Erev Rav is just to bring us down. So you see it with your own eyes. You see it with your own eyes and people believe that. You see sometimes communities, whole communities going after a certain rabbi, after a certain invention. And I'm saying all that because in order to survive this wave that's going to come, you have to be Yerei Shamayim. Yerei Shamayim means God-fearing. You know, I, I have now, where I live, there was a certain disagreement. A few rabbis did an act that I can't call them rabbis, but for the sake of the example, we'll call them rabbis. The fact that they have a rabbinical ordination for me doesn't mean anything. For me, it's like toilet paper, because if you behave like an animal, you're not a rabbi. But nevertheless, three rabbis did a certain act. And uh, when I went to consult the head, the chief rabbi of the city where I live, Rabbi Shmuel Eliyahu, the son of the great Sadiq Mordechai Eliyahu, 
and I told him about the situation, he told me, let's invite them to a Din Torah. Let's invite them to a, a Jewish court, to Beidin. And I said, no. He tells me why. I said, you know who you invite to a Din Torah? Somebody who's God-fearing. <coughs> a person who did this action is not God-fearing. I don't care how long your beard is. I don't, know, I don't care how many pages of Talmud you know of by heart. If you do this certain act, you're not God-fearing. You are wearing a costume 24-7. You're pretending to be a rabbinical authority. Why would I take you to a Beit Din? Beit Din is if me and you have a disagreement and we're both God-fearing people and we're going to the rabbi to tell me what the halacha says and we both believe the Torah and we do what the halacha says, whether I'm right or wrong. But somebody is corrupt. Why would you take him to a Beit Din? I once went, I was called once to a Beit Din 14 years ago. The Dayanim were corrupt. The person who took me was corrupt. I'm standing there with my jaw open. At some point I said, I'm, I'm out. I, I, I'm, I'm going out. What do you mean you're out? You're in the middle of the court. I said, but you're a liar, you're a liar, you're a liar, and you're a liar. This is not a Beit Din. So I'm saying all that because when the wave is going to come, I told you, the ones who are ashamed, that's the first, thing that I, the first one that I told you, Li parame are ashamed. You think that the, there's going to be a selection and the Kadosh Baruch doesn't know who's wicked and who's not? The one who's wicked are going to die on the spot. So you need to first know for yourself, you need to be on the highest level of Yirat Shemaim. Yirat Shemaim means God-fearing. Now I'm not talking about that right now you have a little bit of urge, you have a little bit of Yetzer Hara. I'm not talking about that. You have to be very perceptive of where your Yetzer Hara is taking you. And if you are really Yirat Shemaim or not. And it says in all the sources, the only ones who are close to Hashem, that are hugging Hashem, will survive. The ones who are not close to Hashem, sorry to tell you, there's not going to be any survival here. Now, <coughs> it says in the book of the Zohar, Parashat Shmot, a very long detail of everything that's going to happen in this war, in Acharit Ayamim, the end of days. And it says there, Rabbi Shimon Patach Ve'amar, Rabbi Shimon, or Bar Yochai, started saying, Oy, lemi shiye badora ze rasha. Poor is that guy or woman that is going to be wicked in this generation. What's going to happen? And Ashrei, mi shiye tzadik. Happy is the one who will be called a tzadik. And a tzadik, we're not talking about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. I'm talking about a person that his actions are righteous, that he's good-hearted, he's honest, he doesn't lie, he doesn't slander. He doesn't say Lashonara. He doesn't look how to cheat other people. Okay, so he's not always makes it to the Minyan. But he's a good, honest person. And he does a lot of good. I'm not exempting you from mitzvot. I'm not saying to just be a good person. But it says, Mishi karet tzadik ve'yachzik be'emuna. A person that can be called a tzadik and will be holding emuna. This is going to be the ones who are going to survive. And like I told you, it says there, 15 days of darkness. It says, Rabim yamuto. Many will die. And the ones who are going to die are the ones who don't have Yirat Shamaim, the ones who don't have many other things, don't believe in Hashem. There's also a story with the Baal Shem Tov that it says, this, the story goes as follows, we'll tell you in the short version. It says by a rabbi called Shmuel Rubin. He has a book called Magin Avram. And he says in the name of a great rabbi called Tzvi Moshkovich, who has a book called Me'ariaz Margaliot who says it in the name of the rabbi, famous rabbi from Marinov, who says it in the name of the rabbi of El Azar Midezinkov, who says it in the name of the rabbi Harav Meruvshitz, that one time he spent a Shabbat by the Jose from Lublin. And suddenly at some point during the Shabbat, the Jose from Lublin, who we know had Ruach HaKodesh, stopped, closed his eyes, and he was like this. And he started crying. He started mourning. And then he said, why are, you, why are you crying and moaning? So he says that, he's quoting the Baal Shem Tov, that the Baal Shem Tov once had what's called the Aliyat Neshama, when the Neshama goes up to the world above. The Baal Shem Tov went up to the world above, and he saw thousands of angels all around a huge, huge pot. The Baal Shem Tov tells the angels, what is this pot? The angels elevate Baal Shem Tov above the pot and they tell him, look inside. The Baal Shem Tov looks inside and he sees a pot full of hands and legs. And he tells them, what is this pot for? And the angels tell him 
that at the time before Mashiach is going to come, will come back to this generation all the souls from the generation that is called the generation Dora Aflaga, the ones that build the tower to go against Hashem. And will come all the souls from the generation of the flood. And all these souls will come down here. And what are they going to bring into this world? Pritzut. Pritzut, it means not, being, not modesty. The opposite of modesty. And the hands and the legs that you're seeing is going to be all the hands that are exposed and all the legs that are exposed. And these are going to be the souls that are going to come brown, back down to this world. And they're going to bring impurity to the world. And in Hebrew you say pritzut. In English I don't know how you say it. In English you say half naked. 99% of these people on this planet are half naked. Wherever you go. Women are not modest. Men are not modest. There's no modesty. And then there's women and men all along together. And then men and men and women and women and men and dogs and whatever there is. All sorts of nonsense. <laughs> I mean it's not even funny. <laughs> you think I'm joking tonight. I'm not joking. This is not funny. When you have a gay parade in Tel Aviv. And quarter of a million gay people running around in the streets. I mean, do you think this is what Hashem wants? This is exactly what he said, that the Baal Shem Tov went up and he saw all that. And he says, all these hands and legs are going to be of the hands and legs of the people who come here at the time before Mashiach comes. And this pot is prepared for them to cook them, to bring them down to Gehenom. So when it says, who's the ones who are not going to survive? A, the ones that don't have Yirat Shamaim. The ones... They don't have, they have pritzut. There's no modesty. And the modesty is not necessarily the clothes. It's, how the, it's also the behavior. And the thoughts, and the speech, and the actions. And then there's another problem that we have in our generation. I'm just giving you all these tips so you can kind of see what's going on. There's another thing going on in our generation. I don't know if you noticed, but there's a war in Syria. Everybody fighting with each other. There's a for, war in Iraq, there's a war in Yemen, there's a war in U Ukraine, there's everywhere wars. And you know where's the biggest war? I'll give you a few seconds, see if you can guess. We will fight each other all day long. He's Sephardi, he's Ashkenazi. He's this, he's that. He's straight, he's crooked. He's this, all day long we fight each other. I don't like this guy, why? He belongs to that shul. I don't want to listen to this rabbi, he's from that group. All day long we're fighting with each other, all day long. Everybody's fighting with each other. It's called Sinat Chinam, that's why the first, the second uh, temple was destroyed. Second temple was destroyed from Sinat Chinam, and up until today we don't have the Gula because we have Sinat Chinam, and don't think for one second we don't have it. If I have to find a reason why we don't have Beit HaMikdash and Mashiach, it's because of Sinat Chinam. We have a lot of Torah. Baruch Hashem, go to YouTube, there's millions of hours of Torah. Yeshivot all over the world. Some yeshivots you go in, a thousand students in one shot. And where did we have so much Torah in any generation? We have so much chesed. You know how many charity organizations are out there? How many tzedakah people give? How much chesed people help? We have a lot of good things. But we have Sinat Chinam in uh, storages. The Sinat Chinam is out of control. So we have all these things that are bringing us to a point that we have to understand that this war is coming whether you believe in it or not. If you're smart, you prepare for it. And I mean, there is a chance, if we do tshuva as a nation, that there's not going to be a war. Is this possible? Everything is possible. Can it be done? Of course it can be done, but everybody needs to get their act together. It means serious tshuva, you know what it means? We had almost the Holocaust 2,000 years ago, over 2,000 years ago, with Haman, who came and said, exactly like the Ayatollah in Iran right now, I'm going to destroy you. People think this guy is joking, they think he's doing like stand-up comedy in Iran. He's saying straight out to the cameras, I am going to destroy you, what don't you get here? And people are like, oh, <laughs> let me go back to my coffee. The guy just said he's going to destroy you. Hitler said that 90 years ago. You think somebody believed him? They're like, huh, oh, huh. So Haman also said, I'm going to destroy you. But then we had a Mordechai who said, listen, guys, we have a sword here. In a year from now, we're going to be destroyed. 
What are you doing about it? And they did tshuva. And they did such tshuva, that was a miracle. We all know the story. I don't need to tell you. Purim is in two months. We all know the story of Purim. So we, of course, there's a chance that we can do tshuva. No question here. But, I think you moved the camera. No, 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 no. I'll move. Of course we can do tshuva. Of course we can change. Of course we can bring the geula. But last week, we read, not last week, three weeks ago, we read that Yaakov, when he came out of, now you even moved it even more. Uh, Yaakov, when he went out of Haran to meet, no, no. I'm <laughs> Listen, then I have problems with my editor. Uh, Yaakov, when he went out of Haran, then he was very afraid of Esav. Then what did he do? He prayed. He prepared presents, prayed, pray, prepared for peace, but he also prepared for war. So we have to pray. We have to prepare for peace, but we also have to prepare for war. You can't be gullible and be like, eh. So we have to understand that let's assume for one second we're not going to do tshuva and the redemption is not going to come so smooth. Which I don't want to put bets here, but the situation doesn't look that great. And we're looking here at a serious war that is about to happen. And don't think for one second it's kind of a theory. I mean, we, all you need to, 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 to open your eyes a little bit, all it takes is a few nuclear bombs. All it takes is the first cuckoo to press the button. That's what it takes. The first nutcase to press the button, and this is 4th of July. Missiles are going to be flying everywhere. And today the missiles, they destroy cities. The, 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 the impact. And don't think for one second that if the first bomb falls, nothing happens. It's going to uh, collect, it will draw such a reaction, and we're this close to it, just close to it. Well, you know, constantly you see the threatening and the, the, I don't know if you say it in English, in Hebrew we say rubbing shoulders, like uh, two men. This one's saying a threat, this one's saying a threat, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. This is like that, it can get erupted like that, because <coughs> there's enough hotheads in this world. Now, chas v'shalom, chas v'shalom, something like this happens. Now what's going to happen? So you need to think of a few things, and again, it's, I'm just uh, putting one scenario. If you think it's safe in this country, it's not safe in this country. Look how much anti-Semitism is, is, is in the last year. And every month it's doubling, and every month it's growing, and every month it's going more and more. You think it's going to stop? You think somebody's going to come out and say, okay guys, let's stop, you know, the game's over. It's going to increase, and increase, and increase. I always go to, the, to history. I share that story so many times, I'm going to share it again. We're almost going to be done. I know so you're already like uh, overwhelming and I start hyper hyperventilating now. But <laughs> it's important. My grandmother, she was born in Berlin and raised in Berlin. She came to my wedding 15 years ago that happened here in New York. 2001, I got married. 2000, sorry, 2002. Oh, my wife is now going to see this. Oy, oy, oy. Uh oh. No, no, 2002, mom. honey. Uh, I know it's 2002. So, 2002, I get married here in New York. My grandmother was an old lady. She was proud to see her grandson doing tshuva. And she came to New York to the wedding. She made a journey, came on a ship. She comes to New York. She enjoys the wedding. We hang out here in New York. And after a couple of days, she tells me she was a very cool woman, very lively, very uh, positive attitude very funny to hang out with, and she tells me, do you like this place? Talking about New York. And I'm like, oh, no, no, it's okay. She bent over, I'll remember, I'll never forget it. She bent over to me and she told me, take whatever you need from this place and get the hell out of here. Really? That's what she said. Sorry, I'm using false language, but that's what she said. And I told her, why are you saying that? She told me, you know how New York looks now? Exactly how Berlin looked in the early 30s. Everybody had money, everybody was rich, high society, doctors, lawyers, engineers, business owners, tailored suits. We had a Mercedes. My great-grandfather was a real rich, rich millionaire in Berlin. I have pictures of my great-grandfather with a convertible Mercedes in the 30s. Oh, this is not an SL55. This is the, woo, woo, the you know what it means then to have a Mercedes? Beautiful house, servants. My grandmother kept telling me, we were millionaires. 
Everybody was millionaires. And when people came in the early 30s to Germany and says, listen, this guy, he's cuckoo. Nah, we are untouchable. We control everything here. Who can touch us? Anti-Semitism. What are you talking about? We have a mezuzah on the door. Nobody bothers us. We walk to shul with a talit. We are untouchable in this country. And she told me, year after year, months after months, people came and said, this guy, cuckoo, ran away. You know how many people ran away? A couple thousands. Then when things started becoming worse, it's okay. It's okay. Then things became worse. 1936, 1937, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's not so bad. Now, when it got bad, it was that one second too late. Then you couldn't run away. Doors closed. Armies in the streets already taking you all. You think your money helped you? My grand grandfather was so rich that he had so many connections that a night before Crystal Nach, he gets a phone call from a high ranking officer from the Secret Service and he tells him two words run away. He hangs up the phone. My great grandfather goes home, takes a suitcase, takes his wife and three kids. My grandmother was 17. It was, she wasn't a three year old that doesn't remember. She was 17. And they run away, and the next day, Berlin is under fire. And the rest is history. They ran to Denmark, from Denmark to England, from England to Canada. The United States wouldn't accept them. They somehow ended up in Australia. My very wealthy, respected great grandfather became a mover, a schlepper, acquiring boxes. Months before that, he's with a tailored suit driving a Mercedes, and now he's carrying boxes. My, my spoiled grandmother that had a private ballet tutor and a private piano and a private this and a private that, she's sewing uh, uh, buttons in her plants. They didn't complain that they don't have money. They were thanking Hashem for that we were saved. So I look at history and I'm saying, you think anything is different here? France is... Pfft, Completely out. Uh -huh. London, scared to move there. I was there in the summer. Scare, scary, scary. I was in the summer on a tour. I stayed in a place called Hendon. There's two neighborhoods of Jews connected to each other, Hendon and Golden's Green. There's a long road called Hendon Road. There's about 40 shuls there. Friday night, I go out with my suit, happy to go to shul. My two boys came with me. Every shul has three, four soldiers armed from top to bottom, machine guns, helmets. What is this? This is not some guard that is standing with a suit. Special, special army, you know, the, the, the whole gear, standing with machine guns. This is how you live? It's okay. It's okay. It's fine. Like, you people are out of your mind. Not too long ago, somebody invited me to speak, to give a lecture, two lectures in France. My wife, my wife is like, I don't care if they give you even a million dollars. You're not going there. Europe is already gone. What do you think? Do you think America is going to get any better? Do you think America is going to get any better? You think you're safe here? What if things go, if something goes down here? You think that the police officers are going to help you? Or the police officers themselves, half of them, are, they hate you. I'm going to start, it doesn't matter right now. Muslims, non-Muslims, I don't want to chas shalom create now more hate on the, on the web, <laughs> on, the, on the cameras. But th th just open your eyes and see, what do you think that's going to happen here? You think that something, people had so much hope in Trump. Okay, Trump, fine. I'm going to now go into politics. Good president, not good presidents. This doesn't matter. Do you think, you, you think he can change anything here? And people are here stuck, you know why? I have a nice BMW. Yeah, but <laughs> BMW is not going to help you a lot when the, there's going to be a problem. Besides, you don't even own it. You just pay rent for it once a month. I lived in America. I also had a nice car. It cost me $349 a month for payments. At the end of the three years, take the car back. I don't even own the month. I don't even own the car. <laughs> I've been renting a car for three years. So America, is, well, it's not what it was 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Nobody's really making money here. There's no much fortune going on around. Okay, here and there you see a few. You know what they say? Not everything that shines is gold. Very, very easy to be shiny. And Hasser, don't take anything personal that I'm kind of trying to attack anybody. You know, not too long ago I went somewhere to a community and I said the same words. 
And I sent to, it was also a pretty upscale community, very respectful, a lot of people with money. And one person says, you know, what's your solution? I said, well, you know, you have a few solutions, but I, for years, already telling people, pack up, move to Israel, it's the only place we'll be safe. So one person told me, you know, but if I move to Israel, I'm not going to have money, and how can I donate to your yeshiva? <laughs> I don't need your donation. <laughs> but yeah, but you come to America to fundraise for your yeshiva. So what? So I'll go, you think you, I'm dependent on you right now? <laughs> Kadosh Baruch is going to find me the money. You see me running in the streets asking for donations? <coughs> so what if you're making here a few dollars? The fact that you donate to my yeshiva, you're buying yourself a Gan Eden. You're buying yourself a shield for when the, when the storm comes, that might save you. So I can go now for another two, three hours. There's so much more to say, but the point to take from that is as follows. A, if chas v'shalom, we can put our pants together, our act together, wherever you say it here in America, and we're not going to be able to do serious tshuva, there's going to be a serious war. Don't think for one second it's not happening. Don't think... Like the millions of people who said it in Germany and Europe, here it's not going to happen. It's not, no, we're fine. Don't think, <laughs> there's no difference. That's first of all and most important. Now, what do you do? Now, when it comes to the dangers here of, of, of America, yeah, I've been telling people already for years, go to Israel. What do you have to do here? Israel is the only place that's going to be safe. When the attack is going to start, Nothing's going to happen in Israel. Don't think through for one second is going to, something's going to happen in Israel. Most people say, it's dangerous there. Dangerous here? I'm afraid to walk in the streets here in New York. What are you talking about dangerous here? Walk where I live. There's like two police cars in the city where I live. And they're also sleeping half the time. <laughs> Somebody told me, but they're stabbing in Israel. Okay, so there are two stabbing in Israel. There's 1,500 stabs a day in New York. <laughs> what are you talking about? Dangerous in Israel? There's such supervision in Israel that a few weeks ago the Palestinians shot 400 rockets on Israel a few weeks ago. Not even one person got hit. The only one who died was a Palestinian bus driver. That's the joke. <laughs> and after the missiles fall in the ocean, they get shot in the air, they fall in open spaces. 400 missiles now. Amer Israel is not Arizona. It's like a six kilometer strip. You gotta be very talented to miss. <laughs> and uh, did you want to tell me there's no supervision on the land of Israel? Even the Arabs themselves are saying their God is protecting them. The missiles, somehow, they fly different directions. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so the point is that Israel is the most safest place in the world. And of course comes now the big sugiya. Yeah, but it's very hard there. There's no jobs there. You're right, 8 million people are just sitting and doing nothing all day long. <laughs> it's very dangerous there. There's, Israel is 10 times better than America. 10 times. I, I lived in America 18 years. I moved there 4 years ago, less than 4 years ago. I used to pay here thousands of dollars in tuitions for my kids. I have 6 kids. Now I pay nothing. There's no tuition in Israel. Here you want good health insurance? Israel, there's no health insurance. I mean, no, you don't pay. We took the most exclusive, the most VIP, platinum, whatever you want to call it, insurance. Eight people in my family, 320 shekels a month, less than $100 for the VIP, platinum, best health insurance you can get, eyes, teeth, tuches, whatever you want. <laughs> my seven-year-old goes by himself on a bus to school. Here, your seven-year-old, you have to be under supervision 24-7. He moved. Somebody looked at him. So, 3,400 years ago, Moshe Rabbeinu sent a bunch of spies to Eretz Israel, and all they did when they came back is talk no Israel is bad, it's hard, and so nothing changed. Nothing's bad there. Real estate in Israel, ten times better than America. The economy in Israel, pfft, can't even compare it to any economy in the world right now. Anything, high-tech, agriculture. Now, if you're a bum, then you're going to be a bum in Israel, too. <laughs> and if you're, uh, if you're, I'm sorry, but if, you're, uh, if you don't know what to do here, you're not going to do anything there. Some people come and say, you know, there's no jobs there. But you're also unemployed here. 
You're also living on food stamps and government housing. So be poor in Israel at least. But here you're counting money all day long. 80% of the Jews in America are living on food stamps and government housing and Medicaid and Medicaid and all this. You're here, you're, you're, not, you're not rich here. So what's the difference? So, some of them are coming here on a campaign to move to Israel. But if you're smart, yeah, you move to Israel. Because anyways, we're going to end up there. Whether it's now in a year or two, three years, we're all going to end up in Israel. And if you're smart, you, who, who wants to wait here to see? I, who, four years ago, I was already looking around. And I'm, not, I'm not staying here. I'm already moving now. I'm going to get myself a nice house, a nice corner. My kids are going to already get situated in schools. I'm already ready. So I know it's not so easy to pick up and leave. But thousands of people do it. Thousands. You know, in the early 30s, there were a few thousands that left Germany. They did it slowly. They applied for a visa, whatever. Of course, when you do it last minute, you can't. What do you think is different? You know that half the Jews in this country don't even have passports. What if something goes on? You can't even jump on a plane. So, I know a lot of people call me a doomsday rabbi, but you can call me however you want. <laughs> if I'm going to be able to save a soul or two, that's what matters. So, first you have to understand, you have to get it into your thick mind that the situation is not getting any better. And it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse, not only anti-Semitism, financial, Health. I just came here now. I'm not so aware of what's going on in America. I just landed. And I heard two dirt disturbing news. That now all the Jewish schools in New York, they are forcing them to learn secular studies. And now they're not accepting any kid into any school here that the parents are not going to vaccinate their kids. Don't you think that's a kind of a controlling and mafia here? What's going to be the next step? That you can wear yarmulkes into school. And what's going to be the next step? That you have to, I don't know what... What do you think is going to happen? It's one step, and then another step, and then another. That's exactly what happened in Germany. And then they're going to come with all sorts of rules. You can't do Brit Milah. You can't have a kosher meal. You can't have the mezuzah. What do you think is going to You think it's something going to change. It's just going to become worse and worse and worse and worse. And you already figured out, you, you, you already got the point. Now, on the other hand, you have a different scare. And this is, if you didn't get the, the severity of the danger that any second a world war can erupt, then either you didn't listen or, I don't know, you look, you all look pretty attentive to what I'm saying. Any second, any second, it can happen like that. Any second. You know, I live in the north. I live 30 kilometers from the border of Syria. The Israelis, they have to do some preventive medicine, so to say. So every couple of days they go and attack. I'm sure you hear about it a little bit, and you hear about 10% of really what's happening. But when the Israeli intelligence sees missiles are being moved from one place to another by Iran army, they go and attack that. Of course, the Russians are not happy with that, yeah. so they put a lot of pressure. And a few, few uh, months ago, the Syrians pulled a, a beautiful shtick, they shot down in a Russian uh, plane. None of the Israelis did it. Now the Russians are going against us. And people believe that. The Syrians did it. That's the joke. They shot a Russian airplane with a Russian missile. And then they say, no, it's the Israelis. They came to attack us. So we, we were... You know, sometimes the whole day is 4th of July. Jets. <laughs> flying. And in my heart, I'm like, good. It's, it's, it's happening. Something's going down. And then I get disappointed that nothing actually happened. But the ground is shaking. It's really shaking. And people here, you know, what should I wear today? People are dreaming. So we have a rerun of Mitzrayim. It's going to be the exact same. If Chas Shalom, when or if it comes down, it's going to be complete chaos. Now the question is if some people say you, are, you need to be examined. Maybe you have a serious problem up here. Okay, fine. I, I'm, I'm Israeli. I have thick skin. You can say to me whatever you want. So I, don't get, <laughs> I, I don't get offended or insulted. I'm hoping that you leave this door tonight and saying, okay, it has to be some plan has to be some initiative of something this is not the place now to start giving tips how what who you can contact me privately i'll tell you i guide thousands of people how to do aliyah to israel thousands of family are men moving to Eretz israel they're doing it now they're moving their family they're investing in israel they're bringing business into israel thousands it's not 300 people every month thousands are coming now when you have three four million jews in america 20 30 thousand doesn't look a lot but thousands are coming to Eretz israel 
I think in the last two or three years, about a quarter of a million French Jews came to Israel. You know, that's what a quarter of a million people. There's still about six to eight hundred thousand Jews in France. And they're coming to Israel like in shiploads. Because they already figured out, you know, in France, people don't even go with yarmulkes anymore. I have a friend who told me not too long ago. You know, in all the countries in the world, you, there's always the Chabad shuls. Well, every, every town in the world, you'll find the Chabad shul. He's a Chabadnik, he's a Lubavitcher, and he told me there are two places in the world that the Chabadnikim, they don't wear the black suit and the yarmulke and everything. One of them is Istanbul, another one is Paris, in France. They don't wear the black suits anymore there. This is Pikuach Nefesh. They don't go with the yarmulke, they go to shul and they put the yarmulke on. And the shul is like Fort Knox. Cameras everywhere, one door opens, the other one closes. That's how you want to live? So, yeah, of course, of course. Now, what do you think is going to be any different here? Now, you can be passive. You can go out of this door tonight and say, "Wow!" And then tomorrow, what's for dinner, honey? We're going for sushi, or what are we going for? But the point is that you, if you smart and you, lo you all looked pretty attentive, you smart. You leave this room tonight and you're saying, "Okay, I need a plan." A physical plan, a spiritual plan, a, and a plan. And you want to do it now when things are kind of calm, even though I don't think things are calm. When I, before I leave to come on these trips, I pour my heart to Hashem, please, please, I don't want to be stuck in this country now. Please, let this week pass fast. I'll do what I need to do, just let me get home safe. The second that the airplane takes off, I'm leaving Thursday morning, I'm like, <sighs> I look pretty relaxed now, but I'm, I'm like, <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the gates can close here any second. I don't want to be stuck here, you know, in the, the, at the time, last year in the, in the hurricane, that's when I was like, oh my God, what if I get stuck here? What if I get stuck here? I feel bad. I look at, sometimes I look around, like, this is, this is poor people. So don't ignore history. I mean, <laughs> can you imagine 80 years ago, some rabbi coming to some shul in Berlin and telling them, listen, this guy's commissioned. I'm not telling you firsthand, my grandmother died five years ago. It's not that I'm talking, that I'm... She died when she was 93 years old. I see pictures and she told me every day. She's like, she was like, but don't you think we, we, we knew that? Everybody was so numb. And you know why they were numb? Because they also had materialism then. Then what was popular is opera and shows and culture and designer clothes. That's when designer clothes were in the peak of the peak. Cars came out, traveling, ships, the Titanic, I mean, the Titanic went down, of course, but there were ships, people were going on cruises. I think something, it's only talking about 80 years from now. This generation is already uh, fading out, but what, don't, don't you think that it's, it's already close to our mind? I saw that, you know, I came to America 20 years ago and I already seeing what's going on here. I was like, ooh, I don't like what I see here. Well, it was slow paced. Then 9 11 came in and <laughs> kicked into gear. Up until 9 11, this was the land of the free. And after 9 11, it became the land of the hectic and the crazy and the police and the balagan and the action and the, take your shoes off when you go and flying. I remember before 9 11, when I used to fly, I would come with my suitcase to the aeroplane and do the check in, say, I'm sorry, I'm late, right? I would check in in the plane, and here's my luggage. And they would carry the luggage down to the plane. That's how I used to check in. Now? <laughs> you know how many flights I missed? Because they checked my shoes, and my underpants, and my ear, and my iPad, and my... You know, I'm not joking. You know how many flights I missed because of this nonsense? Go again. Go again. Go again. You already x-rayed my, 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 my bones already. So, there's so much more to say. I think we've reached to a point that I'm hoping you can leave the room and saying, okay, I need a plan. Now, I can highly recommend a few things. First of all, the, all the sources that I said, go and read them. Go and read them for yourself. You can go to the book of Yechezkel, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38, Lamed Chet. Read what it says there. Go to the book of Zechariah, chapter 13 and 14. Zachary, read what it says there. There are, this, this is not news, this is not recommendation, this is prophecies. And all the prophecies already came true. 
Now, A, what do we need to do here is, first of all, in regards to try to get people to do tshuva, that's what we've been trying to do for the last 10, 20 years, you know, how much outreach organizations are out there, how much rabbis are online, how much, yeah, it's to get people to do tshuva. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says in the Zohar, if we do tshuva, miyad nigalim, and we need a group, knish tachada, one strong group that is real tshuva. Tshuva is that you, it's real. It's that you're, you're saying, my tshuva is real. It's praying three times a day in a minyan, if you're a man. It's for a woman to pray once a day. Women don't pray. I don't know who, who invented it, that women are exempt. Women are not exempt from praying. Women has to pray at least once a day. Sephardi women once a day, Ashkenazi women twice a day. This is halakha in Shulchan Aruch. I don't know who says, no, women are exempt. Women are not exempt. You are not exempt. Besides, that the, pa women, the prayers of women are much more powerful. It's saying Birkat Amazon every day. He's giving charity every day. He's learning Torah every day. He's saying Kriyat Shema is being honest, courteous, charitable. Stop being judgmental. Stop being jealous. Stop being so hateful and resentful. And you want to do serious Tshuva and the ground is going to be shaking here. And the only ones who are really Yirei Hashem. David HaMelech says, Yipol mitzidcha elef. Urevava miminecha. Elecha lo igash. Tilim che 91. A thousand will fall from here. Ten thousand will fall from here. Nothing is going to touch you. Elecha mm -hmm. you know, Walk through the, the rubbles. But you have to be Yeresh a real Yeresh You can't afford anything. So it's not about pleasuring yourself with meals. I'm telling you already. Put it to the test. Go one month on a strict kosher diet. Don't eat meat for one month. I guarantee to you, you are going to be super Jew. Super Jew, take my word. Because the meat, most of it is not kosher. Be super strict. Hey, put it to the test. You'll see you're going to be running through to Bit Knesset, to show. You're going to be praying with uh, butterflies in your stomach from excitement. You're going to learn something, you get it like that. Most people, they learn cement wall. I have a yeshiva. Sometimes I look at the students like that. What do you say? I said it pretty clear. What didn't you understand? <laughs> in Hebrew we say, Rosh Balata. This is like a, a brick wall. Nothing, nothing goes in. Unkosher food. Put it to the test. I'm not joking. So this is the time to really, you, you, you have to say, I got to get my act together. I got it. My tshuva has to be extreme. So the Talmud, if you want to get more information, go to Tractate Sanhedrin. In the 80s, 86, 87, 88, 89, talks a lot about it, but it says there, I'll, I'll just summarize it for you. Harotel inatzel mi gogu magog, who wants to be survived, to, to survive gogu magog. Yit asek betorah uvegmirut chasadim. Will be all day long dwelling in Torah and acts of kindness and charity. That's what it says. Yasok betorah. Yasok comes from the word esek. Esek means a business. You're in your business 8 hours a day, 12 hours a day, 16 hours a day. Your Torah has to be a business. Gemirut chasadim, acts of kindness. Acts of kindness is not just to give an $18 check to your favorite organization. That's very nice of you. That's called tzedakah. That's not called gemirut chasadim. Gemirut chasadim is charitable acts that I help and I assist and I go out of my way. And I do things when it's not so convenient for me. And once a week or once a month, I go visit a few, few sick people and I help people. With acts of kindness. And the top of all, the top of all things one can do is called zikui harabim. That you are doing something for the merit of many, many others. Why? Because the Mishnah says, Vizchut harabim, the merit of others, Mesayatam, protects them. That's the biggest thing one can do. is to make sure that I am a, a backup for many, many people. Everybody can do it. Don't look at me like, oh, I can't do such a thing. There's a few thousand CDs outside. Take a few of them. Start giving them out. Put them in different delis, pizzerias, I don't know where. Give it to people. You can't do that. The CDs that cost money. Support it. Now for Hanukkah, we spread it around the world. 25,000 CDs. Just a Hanukkah CD all around the world. They have a, a network all around the world. It costs a lot of money. I don't have money for that. I still owe the printer money. This is not $100. It's 25,000 CDs. First I said, first let's print. Money will come. Zikui <coughs> Arabim is when people depend on me. Somebody depends on you? 
And if you have a thousand people depending on you, you have special protection. Secret service, how do you call it? The CIA, all around you. But the Hashem's secret service, nothing can touch you. You are untouchable. When you are the one who are giving schut for many, and anybody can do it. First of all, people say, listen, I can't really do it. You can't really do it physically, then you do it financially. You do it just, you know, sometimes all you need to do is do like this, a click. Share the movie. Share the, 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 the clip. Send the videos to somebody. Send the video that you just saw and you liked to another 10 people. That's the Kuya Rabim. Some people take it serious. You know how many people I know that they left everything and that's what they do? You know how many people I know that they said, I am done with all this materialism. I am going to devote my time to Torah and to help other people and they're successful. 15 years ago I started doing lectures. I'm sure you all know I have my personal story. So I right away went and started sharing my story, but it was on a very low scale. Why? Because I needed to support to my family. I have kids, I have six kids, tuition, food, rent, clothes. So for about eight years I had a business and I had my organization. So I can support myself and also support the organization. Some of you probably are following me for many years. Many years ago, there wasn't such a thing as a donate button on my website. Everything was free. Everything was completely free. Why? Well, I said, oh, no, I'm going to support it myself. But at some point, my rabbi told me, what are you doing? What are you doing? You have a business. <laughs> Close the business. You have to do not 24 hours a day, 28 hours a day. Don't worry. You'll find people who will support you. There's enough smart people. It was very scary. I'm not going to support my family. Don't worry. Now I work for Hashem. They asked me now here in America, who do you work for? I told them I work for God. I'm not joking, the immigration said, what do you I said, I work for God. Best boss in the world. I'm on Hashem's payroll. Never misses a payment. Payments on time, they come directly into my bank account. I get benefits. Anything. I work for the master of the universe. That's how it works. When you work for Hashem, everything is taken care of. Now, it doesn't mean that you live with Ferraris. I'm not looking for a Ferrari. I don't even have a car. But I don't have debt. My kids eat well. They're dressed well. I have a nice house. I don't, I don't need money in my bank account. I have everything that you have. I also have a smartphone. It's just not glued to my leg. <laughs> I meet it twice a day. And I check with some messages and then and that's it. It's not attached to my leg. Radiating and in my tuchas all day long. It's not that I live in the dark ages, I also have an iPhone. It's just I'm not married to it. I'm going to give you a short story just so you can understand what it means to, to work for Hashem. A few years ago I was invited to a Shabbaton, beautiful Shabbaton. We came there, they took advantage of every moment. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I didn't stop talking. My, uh, my jaw was already like, I, I need a break. 6 o'clock, talk to the kids. 7 o'clock, talk to the teenagers. 8 o'clock, talk to the adults. 9 o'clock, talk to the dead. Uh, don't stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, came the end of the Shabbaton. Yes, they hosted us in a very beautiful hotel. And we ate very well. I didn't eat because I was talking the whole time. But my family at least ate. Came the end of the Shabbaton. We go home. My wife tells me, how much they paid you? How much they paid you? I said, they didn't. My wife is like, what? You came here for three days? You gave her like a dozen lectures? You didn't sleep? You didn't eat? You didn't do anything? They didn't pay you? I said, no. And she was like, why? I said, I don't know. I don't know. She was like, why didn't you ask? I was like, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I came to, to inspire people. I think it's a business. Uh, we need money, we have kids, how are we going to send kids to school? I said, don't worry. Nine months later, it was right before we made Aliyah to Eretz Israel, we lived in Los Angeles. And uh, we're the same thing every day, I was doing lectures and classes and, and came summer vacation and my wife told me our kids need to go to camp. I said, camp? I don't even have money to buy them pizza, what do you mean camp? <laughs> you know, camp costs in Los Angeles for four kids? I said, well, they can't go to camp. She was like, I don't care what, how, who, when. I don't care how you get the money. My kids are going to camp. 
I was like, okay, going to camp, they're going to camp. So we registered them to camp. I can only tell you that a Jewish camp in the summer in Los Angeles is thousands of dollars. And in my mind, I'm like, how am I going to get that? Don't worry, Shem is, Shem is, has many ways. Okay, so on the website of the camp thing, they had an option of applying for a scholarship. Okay, so I apply. What is the reason you are applying? I write them, I'm a rabbi, and I go and I do lectures and Zikui Arabim, and I learn Torah, and I teach Torah, and, and so forth, and I give them my, my spiel. A week later, somebody calls me, hello, Rabbi Anala, yes. This is so-and-so, okay. I'm calling from camp. Oh, how are you? And he tells me, I'm looking at your application. You have four kids, yeah, four kids, Baruch Hashem. And you want them to be six weeks in the camp, right? Yeah, six weeks. And in my mind, I'm Hashem. That's yours. It's not mine. So he tells me, do you know who I am? I tell them, you just said, Mr. So-and-so. He says, no, 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 no. Do you remember me? I said, uh, no. I wanted to say yes, but I don't like lying. I was like, no. So I said, nine months ago, you came, to our, you came to our community and you did a Shabbaton for us. Remember? I'm like, oh yeah, I remember. He's like, you did such an amazing job. The kids were inspired. The people were inspired. Women started covering their hair. Husbands and wives started keeping Tarat HaMishpacha, family purity. Suddenly we had Minyanim every day. You did an amazing job. I said, okay. Thank you for the feedback. Why don't you write it on my uh, reviews on Google there so I can get some of you like five stars or something. And then he tells me, you don't have to pay for the camp. Just pay for the buses, pay for the shirts, and pay for this and that, which all summed up to like $700. He's like, you don't have to pay for the tuition. It's fine. Just send your kids. And I saved probably a five-digit bill. And I called my wife. I told her, you see? I could have charged them for that Shabbaton then, whatever. What would I would charge them? $1,000? $3,000? I got now four kids, six weeks in camp, and all it cost me is a couple hundred dollars. <coughs> so when you work for Hashem, Aboteach Boshem Chesed Yisoveveu. You read every day, and I hope you read every day, but when you read Birkat Amazon, what do you say? Have you, have you ever seen a child of a tzaddik that has been thrown to the side? No, Hashem takes care of things. So why am I telling all you all this? Because your mindset has to change. How much Torah is my day even involved in? Not a minute, not five minutes. It has to be a couple hours. Shacharit, one hour. Stay for the class after that for another half hour. Don't worry about the business. Don't worry. The more Torah you learn, the more business you'll make. Do mincha with a minyan and arvit in a minyan. Learn Torah, read Tehilim, do your, do your things. Shabbat, everything, it's all about, it has to be with, you have to be surrounded and flooded with Torah. And even if you're not so excited about it right now, do, do it forcefully. You have to be surrounded with Torah. Ya'asok betorah. And gmilut chasadim, yeah, gmilut chasadim is acts of kindness. Acts of kindness is also not to be judgmental. And not to be jealous. And not to put somebody down. And not to talk lashonara all day long. All day long, Hashem Yerachem in those storages, in those hard drives of the Lashon Ara. Ta -ta 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 Hashem Yerachem. Just close your mouth for a few hours. It's not, you know, it's, it's not going to hurt anybody. And then, like I told you, Yasok Bezikuy Razbim is just, what can, how can I spread Torah? How can I be part of it? I can give you now a million ways how to do it. I told you now, there's thousands of CDs I came with. Just take the CDs, not for yourself. Just put them around. Here you go, hand out a CD. Don't worry about if somebody's going to throw it to the garbage. One will take it, one will listen, will get inspired. I don't know. Put it in the deli and then the kosher pizza and whatever it is. It's so hard for you to do that? Then sponsor the CDs. They cost a lot of money. Everything that I do costs a lot of money. You know, sometimes I go and I fundraise, people tell me, what do you need money for? <laughs> well, you know, I don't know if you notice, our YouTube channel has 7 million views. What do you think, they just appear there? It doesn't add to it, it works. Then cuts the videos all day long. Don't you think that costs money? You think somebody is just sitting there and volunteering for himself? I mean, you know how many people, smart people, where do you think how we run all this, uh, this show? This show costs a lot, a lot of money. I'm not here to show off to anybody. We have thousands and thousands of followers. Thousands. On just on our WhatsApp groups, 30, 40,000 people. 30, 40,000 people are getting messages every day. Can you imagine the, the, the volume? Videos. 
I don't look at my st st statistics. I don't care. My YouTube channel, I think it has the most views of all rabbis in the world. Seven million views just on the YouTube channel. And with all this, it costs money. That's reaching, reaching a lot of, a lot of people. And the supporters, there's people who are smart, they're saying, uh, you know what, I'm Zevulun, you is Achar. There's a famous uh, partnership in the Torah. Zvulun was a businessman. Isachar was the, yesh the yeshiva bacher. Zvulun said, I will do business, we'll give you 50%. You learn Torah, you give me 50%. Some people are smart, they're telling me, listen, I don't know how to teach Torah. I don't know how to talk to people. I don't know. But we partner. Then you protect it. You, are, you, you, you have a, a, a secret service around you. Because the only way to, be, to survive this Gog and Magog, Torah, Gemelut Chasadim, Zukoy Arbim, that's what it is. Needless to say, the things that I said, Yirat Shamaim, all this, I mean, you have to take this into consideration because, uh, trust me, I know some people that they're so confident and I tell them straight out to their face, I don't think you're going to be one of the survivors. But why? Look how long my beard is. And I go three times a day to, to, to pray. Yeah, but you lie all the time. Mm. You talk to Shonara all the time. You conspire to hurt other people all the time. You think that your Torah is worth anything? You really think Hashem is uh, being impressed by a jacket? You think, you think you can bribe Hashem and tell him I learned Torah two hours a day? Yeah, but you lie all day long. You cheat all day long. You say Lashonara all day long. So you have to internalize this message and you have to understand that you have two options here. First option is to ignore and to continue living your life and to hope for the best. And the second option is not to ignore and to say, you know what, history repeats itself. Every 100, 200 years we have a holocaust. You might not relate with it, you know that 500 years ago was a holocaust in Spain. People think the Spanish Inquisition is that they just took up some, some sortier, tortillas and threw them at the Jews. It was a holocaust in Spain. Go look at history. What happened in Russia and Soviet Union 120 years ago? You know how many holocausts we have? So the holocaust, the our, you know, our, <laughs> the holocaust in Germany is close to our face. We can see it. So you have to understand that we are, in one way looking at it, very auspicious times. You know what it is to see the Gula? I'm so excited. I don't know about you. I'm so excited. I want to see it with my own eyes. Can you imagine the Jews in Mitzrayim seeing the frogs and the hail and the... And nothing happened to them. They just saw it from far away. I'm, I'm super excited. I don't know if people are not excited. I don't know if people are like... <sighs> and the Yetzirah wraps you around his finger. That finger is called an iPhone X or an Android 3 or whatever it's called. And he, everybody's... <sighs> like zombies. And if it's not your iPhone, so it's your iPad. And if it's not your iPad, then it's something else. But we're all so stuck in this materialism that when... Now, if I come and tell to any normal person, pack your bags, leave to Eretz Israel, wrap yourself up and go to Yeshiva. Um, in a year, let me save. Let me this, let me that. You know that two years ago, my, one smart, genius man called me and he told me, what do you think you, I should do? I told him, move to Israel. Take some money, put aside that you have money to live for two years and go and learn in yeshiva. A 48-year-old man learns in yeshiva all day long. His kids go to school, he has a little bit of money saved aside, that's it, he's smart. What do you think is going to save a person when Mashiach is about to come? So to conclude, you have two ways how you're leaving this door tonight. One is that you live the same way you walked in and you had some nice pizza and you heard some... Uh, some good divrei Torah and maybe took a CD for a, a souvenir that will never go into the CD player and will uh, collect dust on it. Or you go out this door and you go home and you make yourself a cup of tea and you say, you don't have to key, it can be coffee, but unless you ate meat before, but you say to yourself, the world is moving faster than I can handle and what, what's, gonna, what's, what's the change? What am I doing? What am I doing here? How am I changing my life a hundred percent? Torah, mitzvot, maasim tovim, changing everything. And a big, a big part of this is, I'm not joking, I know it sounds like a propaganda or some sales pitch. You start looking into calling Benefesh, Benefesh tomorrow. Open an application. Costs a hundred dollars, that's what it costs. It can take you half a year just to run papers to do Aliyah. 
But smart people, well, that's what they do. And how many people I tell them, at least get the process done. It can take you half a year. No matter what a headache it is, go and get an apostille for every document that you have, run to this office, that office. Let's get it done. Why do you care? The application is $100. Do a pilot trip to Israel. 50% of the ones who do a pilot trip to Israel, they fall in love. They're like, I cannot believe that I didn't live here till then, till now. And the other 50% are dying to stay, but they just don't know logistically how to do it. <laughs> do yourself a favor. Come and visit us in Eretz Israel. Come to us. We have a beautiful, beautiful building in Sfat. Beautiful rooms. We have beautiful meals. Torah all day long. Tours. Beautiful weather. You'll be convinced forever. Do yourself a favor because just constantly bring in your mind that, you know what, we're in 1934, 1935, 1936. Somebody would give them the opportunity. How many people stood in those trains and said, ah, if I would just listen. And I would two months ago get up on that ship. Can you imagine the thoughts of these poor people three days standing in a boxcar like that? 150 people in a boxcar peeing on each other. I'm sorry, that's what I'm saying. Dying in the boxcars next to each other. Like this. Why didn't I listen? Why didn't I listen? Why didn't I listen? What it took? Just to show up to Shacharit. What's the big deal? Why didn't I go? I mean, you have to, I mean, <laughs> you have to play it in your mind. So, I hope that you leave this door tonight with a huge change in your mind that you make a decision if you don't know how to do it personally you can contact me it's not that I'm so easy to contact I'm already warning you but nevertheless I work overtime so I can try to answer people a lot of people send me an email then I get upset I didn't get an answer uh, 20 minutes passed well <laughs> we only got 3,000 emails today so I'm very sorry mr. email person you're gonna have to wait so I'm not joking and I want people to contact us. We, have, we hired a few more rabbis to answer questions, to guide people. We guide people in so many different ways. How to do Aliyah, how to convert, how to learn Torah, how to do Tshuva. Baruch Hashem, the organization is growing by, by, by truckloads. And I try, I dedicate hours a day to answer people's phone calls. I do, uh, the phone calls are short. The answers are short, but at least I try to give my, for my time. So you do yourself a favor and you, can, you, you get your act together. And needless to say, that you do it the right way, I hope and wish for you, you'll be one of the ones that we're going to wave to each other and say, Baruch Hashem, thank you, thank you, I owe you a big one. So, not that I need the, the I don't need you to tell me I owe you, I, 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 I'm doing it for many different reasons. I'm doing it because I would want to be warned. I would not want to be in a state of numb. Ah, para. You notice you're all numb? No, no offense, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feeling. But if you're looking at an iPhone more than three minutes a day, you are numb. Sorry. I'm sorry. That, that's the reality. And unless you're watching your show. <laughs> unless you're watching my show. Okay, I'll give you an hour to watch. Fine. If it's me, then uh, you're exempt or any other good rabbi, a real rabbi, not one of those fake ones. The point is that you got to do something. And I, I hope that, first of all, we can take option number one, that we can do tshuva and convince the Gadosh Baruch to bring the Gula in a nice way. That's our highest priority. And that means that we have to reach many, many more people. It means that we have to increase in Tshuva and Masim Tovim. And we have the plans for that. Baruch Hashem, look how many cameras are in this room tonight. How many people are hopefully going to see this, uh, this lecture? So you have to participate in anything that has to do with it. Look at this just nice young man, volunteer tonight to come from Torah anytime, to sit next to a camera. He could go to a movie room today, right? He could go to a restaurant or whatever. Sorry I'm putting you on the spot, but he's smart. He brought two cameras. I want to participate. I want to make sure that people see it, and I have a responsibility for that. You know, people call me and tell me, how can I help? Good. I have a shul. I need 100 sidurim. How can I help? We just ordered 25,000 CDs. I need $10,000. How can I help? We're doing this. We're doing that. And other people help. They're smart people. I'm not taking any credit. You know how many times people come and tell me, you know, you helped me so much. I didn't help you because behind me there's a hundred people who support. I'm just in the front line and then there's the ones in the back. That they're pushing the, the, the train. So, Bezad Hashem, I really, really, really wish, hope and bless you all that, that whatever came into your ears stays there. At least for a couple of days so you can get doing something. 
And Bezat Hashem, that we were able to bring the redemption in a peaceful way. And in Chas Shalom, not, and at least that we should all be from the ones who are seeing the redemption and gathering again in Eretz Yisrael. Bezat Hashem, I hope Hashem will do only, only good decrees on us, and bless us all with happiness and health and success, and we should all see the coming, with Mashiach, coming of Mashiach with our own eyes very soon. Amen.